Welcome everyone. This is our first state committee meeting held over Zoom. We appreciate everybody taking the time to be here. And I want to say that I hope everything goes I hope everything goes smoothly. We seem as if we're about as prepared as we're ever going to be to try to do this kind of meeting through Zoom. We've all been on Zoom meetings for the last couple of weeks. But this is the first time the progressive party has held a Zoom meeting. So here goes here goes hope, hoping it goes well. I, I hear echo though. That was just the uh, the YouTube video starting, so okay. Echo should be good. Okay, sorry about that. So anyway, I want to say a few things before we get started. Uh, I'm going to go through the agenda in a minute, but I want people to, under to make sure that they understand that they're going to be muted unless they unmute themselves. When you're not speaking, you should stay muted, so not, not to give us any background noise or any interference. Um, you can raise, if you want to speak, you could raise your hand through the through the process, through the resume mechanism, or you could send a chat to Josh or Muriel in order to do that as well. Um, I hope that you can hear me. And if you, something happens throughout the meeting, and you can't hear me for any reason, please let me know. Um, it's also, the meeting's also being aired through YouTube lives for people who want to listen, but don't necessarily want to participate. So in terms of the agenda, just quickly, we're going to talk first, we're going to start by talking about some of the recent exciting elections that took place in Burlington that really change the structure and the makeup of the Burlington City Council. So we'll hear about that from the folks involved. Then we're gonna spend a little time going over the primary elections and the upcoming primaries and elections. But Josh will give us an update on how the party's doing there. We're gonna spend a couple of minutes talking about the v Progressive Party website and some funding issues. Jesse Warren hopefully will help us through that. Then a little later on, we're gonna hear from Dave Zuckerman and Doug Hoffer who are asking for our endorsement this year in their campaigns. David Zuckerman for governor, Doug Hoffer for re-election state auditor. We're also gonna hear from three candidates for lieutenant governor, Tim Ask, Brenda Siegel, and Debbie Ingram. They'll each have time to speak with us and then hopefully we'll have time to answer, have asked them to answer a few questions as well. Then we're gonna break into regional groups and talk a little bit about what's going on in the regions. And that'll be an opportunity to talk about the candidates that we just heard from and also talk about elections coming up in your district, how they might be impacted by the work you do. Um, then we'll close on time as well. I want to, um, I guess what I would do is, um, oh, I want to make clear actually that we're going to have, when we do the endorsement process for Dave Zuckerman and Doug Hoffer, people will get a ballot that'll be, I don't know whether the word is emailed, but it'll show up on your screen. <laughs> it'll show up on your screen. There'll be a ballot for you to fill out. So we're not going to raise hands or count votes through the traditional way for, as if we were all in the same room. So you'll get a ballot zoomed to you and you'll fill out the ballot and zoom it back and that way we'll be able to um, make count the votes in terms of those two races. We're not gonna do an endorsement in the Lieutenant Governor's race today. Under our rules, we would have to warn that, that process. We did not warn that process. We actually thought, the COCO thought that giving those folks about five minutes each to talk to us was not necessarily an adequate time to then make an endorsement process and make an endorsement decision. So the, the COCO will hold another state committee meeting sometime probably in early August, which we could choose to make an endorsement then, but we have not warned an endorsement in the Lieutenant Governor's race today. So we don't expect to do that. So it's in, if we, um, it would be out of order given the fact that we didn't give a warning for that, for that process. So what I wanna do is move into the agenda and talk about the recent elections that took place in Burlington for the city council races. I'll let Josh introduce that panel to us and each one will talk for a couple of minutes and then hopefully we'll have time for a couple of questions there as well. So Josh, you wanna take, take it away? Yeah, so again, thanks so much for everyone for joining us. Um, so we thought going into the 2020 election cycle, um, it would be really interesting for folks to hear about some of our really big wins um, from town meeting day um, the, the recap is that we want a historic majority on city council um, for the um, picking up two seats, unseating two incumbent state representatives and or city councilors and one incumbent school board member. Um, so really exciting wins um, from Max Tracy, Zariah Hightower, Adam Haji, and um, Jane Stromberg. So we wanted to kind of give them a little bit of time to introduce themselves because they're all um, other than Max, are pretty new to the party, at least on the state committee level. Um, and we might have a few, a little bit of time for questions, um, but we are hoping everyone could talk for maybe like five minutes or so first and just talk about their experience winning these races, what it looked like and, you know, what they're hoping to accomplish. Um, 
Latin. You want to could, Josh? Before we start, could I just remind people that they should try to use the active speaker mode on their screens? So they don't want to see, see the person on the panel is speak doing the speaking. That's right. So you should see in the top right corner of your screen an option to go to speaker view, um, and that's the preference for this. I'm going to switch that for the YouTube stream um, so people can see who's talking. Um, so that's good. So Adam, can I unmute you? Thanks, Josh. Uh, my name is Adam Haji, and I just recently got elected to the Burlington uh, School Board. And um, I went up against an incumbent, and it was a good experience overall. Um, I want to thank the Progressive Party for all their help. Um, I felt really supported. And um, even though school board is a nonpartisan um, governance, it definitely helped to be able to identify, you know, as a progressive, but um, while keeping in mind that it's nonpartisan. And um, I feel like the experience, I had the opportunity to learn about uh, what it means to run a campaign and as well as connect with um, all of the community members in my area, my constituents, and um, see the needs and the issues that they have regarding the school district. And um, I felt like um, it's important to have a voice on the school board. So being in Ward 8 definitely gave me, I feel like an edge because I also graduated from UVM last year. So um, I, I felt like it's easier for me to connect with um, the constituents since it's mostly uh, college students. And um, I had a really huge um, like support from people, especially James Tromberg and uh, Mark Hughes. He was there with me knocking doors and a lot of other community members too, I'm really grateful for. And I know that this is only the beginning um, of the of the process of the movement and I'm really glad to be a part of it. So, yeah. Thanks, Adam. Um, so I'm gonna go right in um, and invite, I think Jane is on, let's see. Yep, it looks like Jane is on. So we'll invite Jane Stromberg to speak right now. And Jane, I believe, was the youngest um, woman ever elected to city council in Burlington. That's my understanding. So it's really excited. And and Adam, I should also say, I think you um, we said you were you're the first ever the new American ever elected to city council or to school board. That that's kind of a very exciting thing. Um, I think Auden also might be the youngest. I don't have proof of that, too. but. <laughs> definitely in the recent future. All right, and then is this active speaker for me or no? Did I change it? Um, I, th I think you, you should be on active speaker right now. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah. All right, awesome. Here's a big picture of my face. So hello everyone. It's very surreal to be here in this kind of, um, I don't know, during this time, it's nice to see everybody. And also it's, uh, <laughs> it's just it's kind of unreal for me to be in this position here talking to you but I am so honored to have it and I want to just introduce myself for those who you, of you who don't know me my name is Jane Stromberg I ran in Ward 8 in Burlington which is kind of the uh, student hybrid long-term resident hill section ish area um, and I I'm a first I was a first-time candidate I ran on a climate activists, housing and social justice platform. Um, those are things that have been important to me throughout my studies at UVM for which I graduated um, in 2019. And um, yeah, so I am now the city councilor for that district. And it's been, <laughs> it's very interesting to get acclimated to that, especially during a time uh, like this. Uh, COVID-19 has definitely thrown us right into the game. Um, but yeah, our, we had a successful campaign and in terms of success, I don't mean just winning. I mean, we had a very cohesive, respectful team with a lot of 
you know, open communication, we prioritized having, you know, a real heaviness on being inclusive and, and actually cult cultivating leaders to, to, you know, uh, become involved in the progressive party, but also just in local politics, which is something that isn't as, you know, I don't think it has the, the, you know, to us, we're all kind of geeks around that. But I think in general, people don't focus on their local politics as much. And I think it's so imperative that folks get involved. And especially at a young age where that it, the development of, of people's kind of ideologies are so important. Um, so I'm very proud to obviously be a progressive. I've been a progressive minded person my whole life. So it's nice to kind of find this niche and um, be able to join, you know, forces with you all. Um, but yeah, we had a lot of a lot of goals for our campaign. And, um, you know, a lot of that was in regards to, you know, building the movement. It wasn't just about winning. Um, we I went into it thinking it could go either way. And I really prepared myself for any type of outcomes, especially because I'm a human being. I have emotions and, and, and I'll, I'll feel the way I feel, but I think that it was more so, you know, how are we, how are we bringing awareness to the issues? And so if I had any piece of advice or anyone like running for anything ever, just maintain your focus on the issues because no matter what you will be successful, you're, you're, you, you are building what is so meaningful to all of us. And, and that is so incredibly important. So, um, yeah. And I do want to thank like DSA and RAD and and all of you know all of you. Like this whole like this whole win is is because of every single one of you getting involved at some point during any of those races, having input, volunteering. Um, there are just there are so many pieces of energy that you know built up to this, and I just I really appreciated it. So. Um, yeah, and then a lot of the priorities going forward for me are um, obviously climate crisis based. So I'm focused on um, divestment and, and, and that's in regards to the, the city's pension fund and UVM um, and fare free transit and a focus on a lot of the you know, new construction and how we can be efficient with that. Um, and then also lately, well, this was a priority during the campaign, but rent control, tenants rights and that kind of thing. But lately I've been getting so many emails and phone calls about that specifically because a lot of people are not able to pay their rent. A lot of people are feeling, feeling threatened by a lot of the larger landlords in our area. And that's, you know, I'm a renter. I, I identify with that. And so it's, it's, you know, this crisis has highlighted a lot of issues for us. So I think that, um, it's a really important time to get involved with politics in general, but especially with the fact that a lot of issues are highlighted. So yeah, <laughs> thank you. Great, thank you. Thanks, Jean. Um, so um, next up, I wanted to introduce Zariah Hightower and I, I should say for both Jane and Zariah, um, they, they both knocked every door in their districts um, I believe Zariah about two and a half times knocked every door in the district and Jane maybe eight times. It's a much smaller <laughs> ward, but they really, really showed what a progressive campaign looks like when you're spending all your time going out door knocking, talking to, talking to potentially new voters, registering people, bringing new people out. And um, the opposition in, in both, all of these campaigns really had a much more direct mailer centric approach. So it was really exciting. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna introduce Zariah Hightower. And Zariah, like I said, knocked every door in her district over, over two times, ran an incredibly exciting campaign. She's also, I believe, the first woman of color ever elected to the city council, so very historic on that level and um, has just been a tremendous counselor um, since, she, she, since she joined us um, just a few short months ago. So um, Zariah, if you want to tell us a little bit about your race. Yes, hi everyone. Um, I'm sure my face is new to a lot of you because I'm um, extremely new to the Progressive Party, fairly new to Vermont. I moved to Burlington in 2016 and found myself in a fairly progressive hub. I wasn't really someone who historically paid a lot of t attention to national or to state politics, but I did really love cities and therefore paid attention to city policies. 
and soon enough politics. In 2018, I joined the Development Review Board here in Burlington, where I was welcomed as kind of a pillar of diversity. I was minority, I was female, I was a renter, and in my 20s. And it took me a few months to understand that this singularity was true to be, would be true in my perspectives just as much as in my identity. And at the DRB, I over and over again saw that we tended to approve projects designed by distinguished architects, but less so those for small home owner or for small homeowners with hand-drawn plans. Every board member I thought was a kind and thoughtful person, but in my opinion, they were kind of stuck in a paradigm that expensive ideas were good and other ideas were kind of bad. Um, and never mind that when I resigned from the DRB two months ago to take my position on uh, city council instead, I left the nine member board as the only person who wasn't a developer or an attorney. And more than that, I left it as the only female. So I um, feel like there is progress that needs to be made. Um, Burlington, like most cities, is a place of inequality, better than most that I've lived in, but that bar is kind of low. So um, last year I went to Detroit to the People's Convention and it really showed me and highlighted for me just how united we are in our asks really all across the country, but how so many of our representatives are unable to really hear us because of the paradigms that I think they're stuck in. And so back last fall after in Burlington, after months of controversy, I really wanted to see more oversight of the police department. I wanted to see radical change to our transportation system. I wanted to see changes in our parking and our housing policies to move toward a carbon neutral future. And I thought that my representative, who again was a kind and thoughtful person, but had been in place for 30 years, just was not calling for, or in some cases, even allowing some of the changes that I wanted to see. Which is why I ran. And to Jane's point, I think it was just successful just in how we ran more than um, me winning. Um, my amazing campaign manager managed to wrangle 30 volunteers, a mix of old hats who had worked on previous progressive campaigns with 10 times as much experience as I had, as well as people who had never done anything political before. My social media manager had never worked on a campaign. My data manager had never worked on a campaign. Dozens of people had never volunteered on a campaign, knocked on doors, made calls calls, wrote postcards. And so, yeah, I was really proud of our success to not just knock every door um, twice, minus the ones who said, do not knock on my door again. Um, but also, I personally knocked every door in my ward's low-income housing neighborhoods, where the other two campaigns didn't even send a single representative. Um, and then was lucky enough to win, I think, because of the way that we ran with more than half of the votes in a three-way race. And so now the hard work begins and I'm so incredibly lucky and so grateful to have six progressive colleagues, um, but they're not enough. I feel like over and over again, I hear the administration and um, some of the others on the council saying that's not possible or you can't do that. They acknowledge that the systems we find ourselves in are unjust, unfair and equitable from being racist to sexist and homophobic, but they also ironically seem equally horrified at our attempts at any kind of reform. And so I think we need help. I'm sure that my state colleagues feel the same way as they face reports put out by lobbyists with more resources than we have. We need the help of activist groups to separate fact from fiction as we try to make radical change in the way government works and who it works for. We need people to run who aren't part of the paradigm. So we need to recruit. I'm sure all of you know this better than I do as someone who's so new, but um, I'm so incredibly grateful for how the Progressive Party really embraced me as a complete newcomer and really want to say thank you to all of you and I hope you join me in trying to build the movement and the party with lots of new faces. Thanks a lot Soraya. Um, so next up um, our last panelist for this and then I hope we'll have time for maybe just a couple questions um, is Max Tracy and Max is somebody who has been with the party for quite a while. He's been a city councilor for, for many years and um, just to kind of illustrate how far we've come, I, you know, just a few short years ago, I, I know Max would regularly take votes that were like 11 to one with Max being like the one person, um, you know, voting no or voting yes for, for a bill. And now he's a city council president. So um, it really kind of shows what we can do when we really work hard and we have a, 
strong focus and, and go out and organize our neighborhoods um, for progressive change. So um, Max, take it away. Thanks, Josh. And thanks to all the other panelists um, for their wonderful thoughts. Those are just some amazing reflections on what was a, a really historic victory for our campaign uh, this past March. And I just want to sort of put it into context because like Josh said, I've been on the city council for the last eight years. Um, having gotten involved at a time, uh, at least initially, when the progressives were at a real low point, um, you know, and I think that as exciting as this moment is, it's also important for us to remember and just give tremendous appreciation to all the people who stuck with this party when we were at our lowest point. Um, you know, I look at, you know, for instance, Emma and, you know, Martha and others on this, on this call who stuck with it. And, you know, Josh talked about being, you know, one of the only ones. Well, Emma was one of two progressives on the council who stuck it out during really hard times. So um, we really are, need to recognize not only that this is exciting, but also that that came from people really sticking with it, even when it was hard and that we have to stick with it when it's hard because that can lead to victories later on and take the long view. I guess is what I mean to say. Um, so I just want to just give a shout out to all of that. And then to say that also that a lot of these victories were the result also of people being building strong mentorship relationships between different folks uh, and welcoming new voices, but really being willing to also step back and say, you know, I've had my time. I've done a lot on this. I want to teach you as a newcomer how you can do this uh, as yourself and pass on that knowledge. And so I think that that's crucial to remember too, is that if you have knowledge, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be the person to, to run yourself, but that you can really support these new candidates and these new voices in really exciting ways. I mean, I thought we saw a lot of really cool mentorship happening in this, in this particular council race uh, or this election season that was incredibly helpful. Um, in terms of some things that I saw that were different or unique about this particular race um, or why this race turned out like it did, I think that just in terms of broader context, um, we have a, a situation where uh, in Burlington, I'm sure many of you being political junkies follow sort of um, the, the different things that happen, but um, we um, in Burlington have a, um, we have uh, a mayor um, who has embraced a very neoliberal uh, agenda when it comes to uh, things like development, wanting to see deregulation and embrace market-driven policies in order to um, really try and benefit um, folks who by and large are already doing okay for themselves. And so um, that has resulted in a number of decisions, um, namely things like City Place, um, which is the mall redevelopment that um, where they basically gave away way too much to developers, gave them what they wanted, and what that's left us with is a hole in the ground. And that was a particularly uh, motivating issue for the voters that I spoke to. I think just as Zariah was also mentioning, uh, police reform becomes a, is, has become a huge issue in Burlington uh, in the past year with a variety of different issues um, happening, uh, whether it was uh, violence against men of color uh, in the community or uh, the social media scandals that emerged. Those were uh, also motivating factors for voters that really, I think, helped to drive uh, that progressive message uh, in some senses. But um, you know, that sort of broader context was not enough. It really took our organizing efforts to um, make that happen. And when I say organizing efforts, I mean actually getting out, like Josh was saying, that, that door knocking that uh, we all did over and over and over again in communities. For me, it was a little different than, than, than for some of the new candidates in the sense that I'm going back to already established relationships in a lot of cases, though I live in a, in a district, in a ward that turns over quite frequently. So there are always a lot of introductions in a campaign. So again, that door knocking piece is crucial. And I think we saw that because, you know, my opponent didn't get started door knocking until, you know, later on in the race, he tended to, and this is something that we saw largely from the, our democratic opponents was there was a coordinated centralized strategy that was funded through uh, developer money, um, many thousands of dollars, in fact, more money than we've ever seen in city council races, um, largely from folks who have a lot of money and uh, were donating thousands of dollars into these campaigns, which were then used to funnel into direct mailers. And, you know, I had never seen anything like this in terms of direct mailers. I saw maybe four or five, six pieces going uh, just into my ward alone. Uh, and that had me pretty worried, honestly. You know, I did basically one lit drop and that was it. Um, wanting to really conserve on paper, you know, I felt like if I'm talking about climate crisis, I shouldn't be throwing tons of paper at voters. So um, that was something that was, uh, interesting and it had me a little nervous, but again, it's just important to remember that 
nothing makes up for human contact, nothing makes up for that, putting in the time yourself and engaging with voters. Um, another change that I saw in terms of this election that was interesting or that was a shift was also that uh, we saw less viability or less going into um, less responsiveness to phone calling or phone banking. People just aren't answering the phones anymore. So texting becomes much more of a, of, of a strategy or a thing that we that we do and our opponents used it as well. Um, so that was something that you know was a shift or something that we saw as being different uh, in terms of our races. Um, and then another interesting and really positive change that I think was in influential in this in these races um, was the coming together of a variety of non uh, political party groups in support of our candidacies. And by that I mean we had e and I say we because I think all of us got endorsements from groups like Sunrise, which is a, a, a climate justice movement uh, coming out of UVM. We had DSA Max, Democratic couple, Socialists. Yeah, Max, a couple of uh, minutes left. Just a reminder. Okay, yep. Sorry. And then we also had um, uh, groups like uh, Rights and Democracy also providing a lot of um, sort of on the ground, like they provided a phone banking space for, for us as an endorsement. So uh, in addition to uh, organized labor support. So we saw, and that was something that I really hadn't seen in council races in years prior. So all of those factors were some, some of the differences that I saw in this race. But again, just want to emphasize the fact that we also that that so much of this came from really putting in the time and doing that direct that that direct voter contact from door knocking. So um, that's something that I think we need to continue to, to build off of. I think it's going to be really challenging this fall, um, given that um, it's not clear as to whether we'll be able to do a whole lot of door knocking. Um, we'll have to figure out different ways of generating meaningful contact with folks. But again, that seemed to be decisive in these races. Thanks a lot, Max. Um, Marielle, do we have time for questions? A couple of questions. Oh, sorry. Do, do we have time for a couple of questions, Marielle? Yes. Okay. Um, I, it, yep. Sorry, I thought you heard me. Great. Um, yeah, so I saw one question. I see Frank has his hand up, and there's one question from Frank. So I'm, I, I'm just going to read his comment. And maybe we can um, you can address this. Um, so what the question is, what are we going to do to transcend door knocking when we can no longer door knock? So does anyone, obviously your campaigns were really heavily focused on door knocking, but do you have any thoughts on like what and any ideas for kind of candidates who are announcing soon um, or have already announced and are getting gearing up for their campaign, like different ideas? Does someone want to quickly address that? So one thought that comes to mind, and this is something that Emma taught me, um, was about um, like postcard writing, like handwritten postcards. And I know that's still like a handwritten thing. So people you know, may feel a little weird about mail, but still like that's a way to personalize uh, an email or personalize, give that personal touch uh, to voters, especially if it's someone that you already know. Um, but another strategy can be to um, engage folks in your district and ask them to, to, to write to folks who they know as well. Um, again, that can be a strategy to just create um, direct, meaningful contact with people um, and make them feel like you value their perspective. So that's just one idea, but I don't know if others have anything else. Anyone else want to address that? No, I actually have the same thing. I was, I've been <laughs> advocating for postcards because I think those are quite effective. And then I think just being better about having like to Max's point, it was easier for him to run um, since he already had some of those reestablished connections and then it was just about like spidering out from there. Um, and so I think just having a better progressive base that can help us um, help others in elections. So, you know, as we're running for state things, it also helps that at least in Burlington, we've got our network, people know, if people know who I am. So if I'm like, oh, I really like this candidate that helps. I just want to, this is Anthony again, I just want to, as someone who's weathered some of the ups and downs of the Progressive Party over the years, I must say that this has been one of the most inspiring elections I've experienced in a long time. And to see all this new energy, it's, in some ways it's new energy, but it's doing the same old stuff in terms of the nitty gritty work of knocking on doors and whatnot, but also ironically dealing with the same issues that we've been dealing with all these times over time, but it's really inspiring to see young people, people of color, different kinds of Vermonters rising up and taking power. And, you know, we used to talk about how the 
progressive coalition started around Burlington, then spread around the state. Now we've been able to spread ourselves around the state, but it's really inspiring and really great to see this kind of new energy coming into Burlington again, once again, because I think it'll help inspire us as we move forward around the state as well. I mean, I just really wanna congratulate you all. I mean, as somebody said, remember you're just human beings, which I think is important to keep in mind. It's, you're just human beings, but you're doing all the right stuff. And I think that as Max said, being, being willing to stick with it through the good times and the bad times. We all know that political change is a long-term process. It took us a long time to get into the messes we're in. We have ingrained racism and ingrained inequality and whatnot. I think it's gonna take us a while to set things right again. And I just really wanna say how much I appreciate all you folks for doing the hard work you've done and getting yourselves elected. I really look forward to seeing your good work on the city council side. I really appreciate it. Um. I did see that Kit, Kit Andrews had her hand up. Um, I don't know if we have one time for one more quick question. Just gonna uh -oh. I'm gonna un un I got to unmute myself. Uh, okay, I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah? Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you, Max for uh, putting neoliberalism as uh, a, the context and the lens uh, right up front in your comments. Um, it's a worldwide movement that's been killing us slowly for years. And, and I really appreciate that you um, put our mayor into that. So the question would be, um, uh, so behind the question, I just, I encourage all of our progressive leaders throughout the state um, to be aware of that. And so I, I just want to see if um, Zariah or Jane or, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce your name, Aj Adan. Anyway, if any, of you, if, if any of you just have a comment to make on that. So, make, sorry. Did, did that make, want to respond to that? No. I'm so sorry. Can you say the question again? <laughs> um, just uh, to, um, it, if you don't have an answer, it, it's not. It, it's like half encouragement and also half question. So the question is: uh, Are you thinking about the your platform and your program and the things that you're most interested in doing in the context of neoliberalism, um, which is a worldwide movement uh, very ably represented by B Moreau and everything he stands for. <laughs> Do you want to go first? Say, you go first. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> um there's a lot there for sure. Um I so I'm just going to simplify it a little bit and then we can build off of it. I went into this extremely optimistically because there were so many progressive leaders not just on council but throughout Burlington and throughout the state that I know that I you know if I had to make a phone call and ask a question or something that someone would be there for me. And I felt like incredibly supported with that kind of fundamental background going into this. Um, and so I think that, yes, the agenda on the Moreau side of things differs from what we are focusing on. I don't think that it is anything to feel disheartened about. In fact, it, like, it keeps me going and it keeps me alert and it keeps me like doing my homework every day. And I think that it is, it's a harmful agenda in many ways, but I think, and I, and I think this is kind of agreed upon, we, our potential is like scaring people. <laughs> and it's, and it's in, in a good way. We're really kind of building out that capacity, but we're also trying to be a little bit self-critical and saying like, are we being inclusive enough throughout this process? Are we actually practicing what we preach? And so I think that us, you know, having self-awareness as a party, um, you know, that makes us, and I don't want to say, you know, from a human point of view, who's better than another, but like, it makes us a better group of people in terms of how we carry ourselves. And, um, and that was the main thing that I kept in mind throughout my 
campaign was how, you know, how are we walking the walk every single day? And so, yeah, neoliberal, neoliberalism is, um, it's, it's got a lot of tendrils in our society and our unfortunate systems that we function in. Um, but I think we're, we're starting to really name it and we're starting to say like, hey, and I think that they're kind of feeling that pressure a little bit more boxed in and not just because of our numbers, but because of the way that we present our ideas and the ideas that we're using um, to build the momentum. So it's kind of like a nice little roundabout way, but um, I can get to the nitty gritty. I don't know, Zarai, if you want to answer any of that. Yeah. I guess I want to, like, I, the first, the first economics course I took was taught by communists, but I am, like, for better or worse, still a classically trained economist, which in, like, a sense means neoliberal economics. And so I've, and my job is also extremely neoliberal. And so I've, I've both found this to be like a good avenue to like question like my own personal beliefs on a daily basis, but um, more, um, more importantly, it just makes me incredibly grateful for the counselors that it's not like if I had been maxed by myself for like years, I could, I can't even imagine like how that would have changed me. Whereas I've got six other progressive counselors who are like, we're holding each account, each other accountable every day, every week for how we talk about things, how we engage. Um, and I find that to be an incredibly effective way to keep, like to Jane's point, that conversation to be like a better group of human beings, um, regardless of the paradigm or the world that we find ourselves in. Thanks Thank a lot. you. Yeah. I was just gonna say, um, I think that's, that's time for this section. Um, I do wanna say, so Robert Millar just posted a donation link if you're, a regular attendant at these meetings, you know that we normally um, send around donation envelopes and encourage people to donate to the Progressive Party. So I'm gonna resend that link right here. These successes, we, we were outspent like three to one in some cases, huge amount of money was coming in from developer developers and big business interests to oppose like this whole slate of counselors um, and, and Adam. But um, we, we showed that even with a little, you know, with a little bit of money and a lot of hard work in a grassroots network, we're able to kind of overcome that. It does still take money and we're gearing up for the 2020 election right now. So I really hope um, people can consider um, making a donation to the Progressive Party to kind of continue to support our work and um, build for 2020 and elections. Um, I think it's also important to note again what people said about the mentorship that took place in the Burlington races though. And also um, the staffing, which made a difference. So Josh's good work makes a big difference in terms of giving people the support they need to be successful. So I appreciate that as well. We're gonna run over time if we're not careful, of course, but the next thing on the agenda was to talk more about upcoming elections, which means we have to listen to Josh again for a couple more minutes, if that's okay. Um, yeah, this will be quick. So I just wanted to, um, we just wanted to give people an overview of what the election scene is looking like this election. It's been challenging, um, somewhat somewhat challenging to recruit given just the nature of, um, you know, the COVID epidemic. But we do have, I think, our, our building towards some good House and Senate campaigns. Um, we are going to have our, um, our filing, de the filing deadline for statewide offices is on May 28th. So it's coming right up. Um, that said, you know, we have a bunch of potentially exciting candidates coming up, um, including our former um, party chair, Emma mulvaney Stanek is running, and I think she's on this meeting. Um, Jesse Warren, who's our former legislative associate, is, um, is running, um, and he's going to be speaking about um, some of the web, web design updates in a few minutes. Um, we're also going to have um, Tanya Vyhovsky, who is on our coordinating committee, I believe is on this meeting. Um, is running in Essex, and that's very exciting. Um, we're going to have some tough retirements, um, which you know you never you never like to see that. But we also respect that people have you know their personal personal things and obligations. And um, I especially want to thank Sandy Haas, who is not going to be running for re-election. We're working on recruiting someone um, in in that in that race, and then um, Zach Zach Ralph who won election in a very exciting race two years ago is getting married and moving to Montpelier. So won't be running for reelection. And we've, we've been incredibly excited to have him, but um, 
he won't be running this time and maybe he will again in the future. Um, we have uh, recruited someone to run in his seat, um, Elizabeth Burroughs, who we're very excited about. Um, there's a woman in Barnard who is running as a progressive, um, Heather um, Pupiano, I believe. I'm sure I got the pr pronunciation wrong, um, but we're very excited about her race. Um, so, that, you know, there are a lot of exciting things happening. Um, after May 28th, we're gonna be reaching out to folks um, for our local town and county committees to kind of set up endorsement and, and nomination meetings. Um, if you remember um, going through this process previously, um, many of our House candidates and Senate candidates run in the Democratic primary and the local committee will meet to nominate them um, to basically fill a vacancy on the general election ballot. So um, that's, that's something I'll be reaching out to town and county chairs, especially where we might have candidates to kind of um, work with people to set up those meetings. And we are also still recruiting. So if people have ideas um, for candidates and um, districts that they think we should be running in, um, feel free to reach out to me and um, I'm, I'm talking to candidates all the time. So um, we definitely want to kind of move forward with that. And we're really excited, especially coming off of the wins in March of 2020. And um, I did also just want to flag for everybody, there is a little bit of a challenge um, given, uh, you know, on our statewide ticket, some of you may be familiar. Um, there's, there's somebody who's filed to run as a progressive who, for, for the offices of governor and Congress, who is not at all a progressive. She's actually quite racist, um, has, has some pretty racist platform principles. It's uh, Chris Erickson, who you may know from previous, um, previous times that she's run for statewide tickets. Um, so for whatever reason, she decided this time that she was gonna file to run as a progressive for both Congress and US Senate. And we are kind of recruiting people as we have done in the past to potentially run on the primary for for Congress, um, and um, you know, and um, likely will be encouraging the write-in vote for David Zuckerman, um, assuming that this committee endorses him today. Um, so, um, I'm happy if people have questions or thoughts. Um, if we have time, I think we just have ten minutes for this section, but I'm happy to talk a little bit if anyone has any anything they want to discuss for elections. I guess everybody feels okay. So if there, aren't, if there aren't any questions for Josh right now, we did want to spend a couple of minutes talking about the website, new website design and the ability to use the website for fundraising more than we have been in the past. And is Jesse on the, on the call, on the, on the Zoom? Jesse Warren? Yep, here I am, Anthony. Hi, why don't you just talk a little bit about what you've done. You've done a great job of revamping the website and whatnot and the shirts. And just talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. Um, well, it's great to see everybody and so many familiar faces. And uh, so far, this has been a great meeting, really inspiring to hear everyone's stories and see all the awesome, awesome candidates uh, that I'm really excited to see um, do really well in this election. Um, so when Josh told me that to talk about kind of the website and the design stuff. I was like, I don't know if, I think people probably don't want to talk about that. They want to talk about the issues and talk about the elections and stuff, but he was like, no, no, talk about it, it'll be good. So I'll just really quickly kind of tell you guys how it came together. And I was thinking of what, if I'm going to talk to you, what would be kind of the little seed or little nugget of an idea that I maybe would like people to think about. And I guess it's really just that and I'm going to expand on this a little bit very briefly, but it's to me really interesting to think about the way that design and kind of the creative side of things can really be a powerful tool for activism and change and organizing and bringing people together and helping move issues forward um, and the party forward and the movement forward. Um, so really quickly, kind of the way it came together is I was hired as legislative associate for the party in about in February. And I was, my job was going to be to be at the state house every day, tracking bills and committees and working with our legislators to support them as, as they're trying to get their work done. But when the 
state house got shut down with COVID, there was this period where it was like, I was still on the payroll, but I couldn't be doing that aspect of my job. So went into kind of saying, can I use this time to redo the website and maybe work on some other creative projects? Um, so, uh, sorry, there's a little noise coming through here. Um, but um, so, so basically, Josh, I guess I'll just share my screen um, and maybe I'll try to get away from this noise, sorry. Can you guys still hear me? Okay. Um, so yes. Oh, Josh, it says screen sharing is disabled. Um, do you want me, I'll, I can share. Are you just looking at yeah, the website? Yeah, that's fine, yeah, if you wanna. I might have it set so only the host. Yeah, as long as it'll show up for people while I'm talking. Um, hopefully there's a way to do that. So yeah, I'm, I'm gonna share it right now. Okay. Okay, so can you guys all hear me and see the screen? Is that, um, okay, I hope so. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, okay, sorry, the noise just keeps coming. Okay, so basically, yeah, so I just wanted to kind of let you guys know, so there was this process that the party had gone through over the past, I guess, kind of like two years where we were thinking about what, um, how do we want to update the progressive image, the brand as a way of kind of moving forward on and, and improving our ability to, to communicate and, and just update our, our refresh our image. Um, so we kind of took some of the ideas that came from that. Um, and we, um, you know, I guess kind of the, uh, one of the things I really want to really want to just get across here is that you can really, I think for candidates, especially in this time where we have to deal with COVID and not being able to talk to people in person, and we have to do so much um, uh, digitally, you can really communicate and tell a story and get people excited through visuals um, that maybe would be a lot harder to get across if you had to kind of explain it in a, in a long, you know, article or something like this, this, this visual on the website, to me, it's kind of like, you know, we could write a big, a big article and say, you know, the progressive party has been doing this for a long time. We're going to keep going. Um, we're part of one big story, all believing in these ideas and we're continuing to grow, continuing to build our energy, continuing to build our movement. Um, but you can also kind of, it, it's possible to put it together in a way that just makes, says that like this. And I think that's a way that can really that that's something that can really um, help us build our movement, build our party, build our, our energy. Um, and the one little thing just to point out is like, it's, I think one of the reasons the design and the creative side doesn't often get, um, it's kind of, it's always kind of viewed as this like side thing, you know? Um, um, and I think one of the reasons for that is it's not quite measurable. Like I can't, can't really measure what the impact of, many, many people seeing an image like this is gonna be. But I think it helps to build the kind of connections that, that um, bring us together as a party and as a movement. And it kind of manifests itself in, in, in ways that are not quite measurable. You can't say like we raised this much money or whatever, but I think, I think it really builds us um, as a movement and brings us together. Um, so that's kind of that. And there's a lot of people in this image who are on this call both uh, from every generation. Um, so that's, that's just to me always an amazing thing. And as I was putting this together, I was like, wow, I can't believe these people that I get to kind of, um, you know, talk to every day are like part of this great history. So it's really, really, it was really inspiring for me to work on this. Um, the other thing that kind of grew out of that phase where I was like, what do I do now to be useful to a party now that I can't be in the state house um, was these t-shirts that we put together um, as a fundraiser um, for the party. And this is definitely inspired by the state of the progressive movement nationally. And, and you know, where do we go now without the Bernie's presidential campaign as kind of like this big umbrella to remind us that these ideas are mainstream and, 
and just reminding us how that's something we have to keep pushing for and fighting for. Um, so thinking about this idea of, of the design and the creative stuff as a way of organizing, as a way of activism, as a way of building a movement, um, we put together this shirt, which um, got really great response. We've sold um, over a, a hundred shirts, uh, many in Vermont and many all across the country from people who are just excited about this idea and this, what we're trying to say here. Um, but, you know, my hope is that this will be a way for us to just never forget what we're really doing here and to keep, keep pushing the movement forward. Um, so we're gonna be closing the pre-orders for these shirts soon. And uh, maybe Josh will talk about that a little bit, but if you want one, please um, go to the site and, and get one because we're about to send them to print. Um, and I guess, I guess, Josh, that's pretty much, pretty much it. Is there anything that I missed that we should talk about or? I, I think that's good, unless there's a quick question or two. I did just post the link to the, if people want to purchase shirts, um, I just posted the link so people can, can do that. Um, we're gonna put those orders in very soon, so keep an eye out. I, I think it's really, Jesse said it's just good. I think it's better than good. I think it's really, really great. Did a really great job. I'm glad he was willing to put his creativity to work on behalf of the party. It's really well done. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Anthony. And I did also, it, it was Jesse's last day in um, the end of, end of April. Um, he finished May 1st. And I just want to say it's been, we've all been incredibly impressed and excited. And it was a very kind of weird time to be entering the legislative associate position, but I think his skills were ended up being really useful um, during that time and doing updating some of this branding stuff that we've been talking about for a long time, but haven't had the expertise to be able to get there. So um, it's, it's just been really, really incredible. And we're excited that Jesse's running for state rep now too. So that's, um, that's exciting. And if, you get, if you get a chance to um, visit his website for state rep, he made a video and kicking off his campaign, which is incredibly well done. It's worth taking a look at. It's really, really did a good job. Cool. So we're actually on time, it seems, for the most part. Um, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take some time to hear from Dave Zuckerman and Doc Hoff. First, before we go farther, I presume Dave Zuckerman is with us. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. And is, I'm wondering, is Doug Hoffer here? Yes, I am. Okay, I just want to be, make sure that we knew who we were talking to. So we've set aside about a half hour for these two folks to talk to us. So sort of 15 minutes each, obviously, but I would leave it up to them if they want to talk for five minutes and take questions for 10 minutes, or if they would just want to talk for longer. We have a total of about 15 minutes each, if that's, if that's okay. And Muriel will be keeping track of time as we go along. So first thing I would want to do is start with Dave, Dave Zuckerman, who, as we all know, needs no introduction to the Progressive Party or the Progressive State Committee. So Dave, we're glad you're here and we're pretty excited about what you're about, what you're doing. So take it away. Uh, well, thank you, Anthony. I uh, really appreciate it. And uh, that website is really fun to look at. And, and yeah, having so many of those folks on this call, but also looking at the just the pictures of the timeline and how it really just grows with what the party is doing. Uh, I actually just got off a phone call with uh, John Nichols from The Nation and talking about some of the history of the Progressive Party and Bernie, as well as you know my race for governor. And uh, one of the points I made was that if you look at Burlington now, the concern of the 80s and 90s was, was that progressives were gonna take down the Democrats. But obviously I think the evidence is clear that uh, both in Burlington on the city council and in the legislature in Montpelier, what's actually happened is Republican uh, influence and seats have shrunk while progressives have grown. And even in some cases, Democrats in the legislature have grown. So it's really um, been a testament to the issues taking the priority and that by shifting the conversation from center right, which has been the history to center left uh, has actually been well received by the public and uh, is moving things in a good direction. So I just wanna thank so many of those people who have spent that time you know, Bernie for 40 plus years and people like Martha, but, you know, I saw Earhart in there and Tom Smith and Barb Prine and, you know, so many other faces that, uh, you know, put the time in. And I was just thinking how excited I am that there's 
you know, I might have been quasi generation two and we're like moving into generation four of elected progs now with some of the new counselors and, and the races coming up this fall. So just kudos to everybody. Uh, briefly, I want to just talk about two aspects of my life right now. I'm lieutenant governor and what I'm doing as lieutenant governor and then uh, the campaign for governor. And as lieutenant governor, obviously, things shifted quite a bit instead of presiding over the Senate four times a week, although that's going to start again next week. Um, much of my work has been constituent based, helping people get through the unemployment system, answering questions about all the shifting rules and parameters of the COVID crisis and, and the governor's orders. Um, so I've been doing a lot and, and Deb Wolf took over as my chief of staff. She has been doing yo person's work on responding to constituents and helping constituents. And I have to tell you the number of calls from around the state for people who are economically stressed and not getting through unemployment and not getting through the PUA program for independent um, contractors and self-employed has been uh, really distressing to see. And it's really um, exposed the two worlds of Vermont. Those who are home and relatively comfortable and able to buy food and pay their bills. And the other, you know, 100,000 plus people who are paycheck to paycheck out of work and are really struggling right now. And it's just exposed that, that challenge that we've been fighting about and for those people for decades, that even in a good economy, when it came to a crash quickly, they were on the edge and falling over the cliff. And we've been doing what we can to help them, um, including uh, a number of things, not just uh, updates that I do on Facebook Live a couple of times a week, just answering people's questions, but actually after about a month and the unemployment system's still a mess, I sent a letter to the commissioner of labor saying, why don't you just send a check, get the, get the National Guard in, answer the phones, get names, address, social security number, and mail them a check. And when we get through the system two, three, four weeks from now, you can square up how much more or less you owe them because you're gonna owe them for weeks of unemployment. And he said they couldn't do that. And the next day the governor said, we're gonna send people a check. So, uh, you know, I, I think and hope my letter helped made that happen. Uh, but those are some of the things you do when you're in office and maybe also while you're running to put pressure for the right thing to happen. I did that on farmers markets as well. And more recently also around vote by mail where the governor has really taken the wrong position and uh, clearly the state is behind the option, uh, the, the people of the state for being able to vote by mail, everybody getting a ballot and then being able to um, exercise their, their right to vote without risking their health. Um, putting a lot of information out there around the CARES money, uh, the 1.25 billion to try to find out creative ways for Vermont to use those resources to both rebuild the economy, but do it from the ground up. Whether that's uh, working with restaurant owners to see whether they can be makeshift kitchens with delivery to people like Skinny Pancake is doing, but expanding that across the state. Uh, looking at broadband, which now is an everyday topic, but wasn't before. Uh, so some of that. And then more recently, pushing back on the governor's insane proposal to revote school budgets, which is just um, unbelievable with respect to the timeline, warnings, the ability for people not to even gather to learn information and vote. Uh, it was just such a, a thrown together proposal on his part, but uh, to speak out and say, that's not the way we solve our budget problems, especially when Congress is probably gonna send a municipal funding bill. Um, child care centers, trying to think much more creatively about them, whether we start utiliz utilizing our school spaces uh, with CARES money, who knows, but many, many people are concerned about opening up child care centers and having 15, 20, 25 kids in one space. So just articulating a lot of the issues that I'm hearing from people is a big piece of my job as Lieutenant Governor. Now to shift gears, and I know I'm talking really fast. Um, I appreciate everyone's patience. Um, the campaign, uh, obviously the COVID crisis, like through the traditional ways of campaigning and the traditional plan that we had for rolling things out, uh, totally up in the air. I don't think I have to really articulate why everyone's living it right now. But what's interesting is the campaign, I'd say for those first four weeks, uh, we were the first campaign to suspend in-person events. We were the first campaign to suspend any kind of email, hard asks for resources, figuring people would be helping their neighbors and helping themselves. And others followed suit. 
uh, but it was good to be out front with that and showing that sort of hopefully vision and leadership that we're looking for to take over the governor's office. Uh, but it's also been amazing. My team, uh, Meg, Colleen, Dan, Martha, Maeve, Emily, working ridiculously hard. And thankfully, I think everyone took a little bit of a breath this weekend because we shifted from a planning stage of a campaign to doing everything we could for COVID, to doing virtual roundtables, virtual meetings. I've had roundtables on healthcare. I've had roundtables on with different teachers, had roundtables with agricultural folks and restaurants, conversations with all kinds of people uh, to start planning for what are we doing to get out of this and what are we gonna do for the new Vermont we wanna rebuild instead of it just being built like it was in the past with half our state living paycheck to paycheck, racial injustices and police force challenges. Let's rebuild in the new way that takes the, the good of the past because there is a lot of good to Vermont, but rebuilds uh, with a better economy for all, looking at universal health care. I mean, coronavirus, suddenly universal health care, if it's a contagious disease, is a good thing. I don't care if you have a broken leg. I don't care if you have cancer. It was the old school thinking. But now universal health care may be a topic to keep talking about. Uh, minimum wage, food systems, et cetera. So there's a lot going on um, with the campaign in organizing around all these issues and helping quasi be COVID support and planning for the future as we come out of it with CARES money and other bills from Congress. Um, I will say uh, we've talked with amazing people around the state. We had a uh, round table in the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, I've actually picked up Bobby Starr's endorsement, which is one of the first times he's endorsed in a primary. Um, and uh, we're working on building a resilient future around food and carbon sequestration. Um, and uh, we actually just launched our first video. I don't know if anybody saw that online, but if you want to view it and share it with friends, we're looking for the low cost spreading of the video. So one way everybody on this call could help is to go to the website or go to my Facebook page or YouTube channel. And Zuckerman 4 VT is basically the tag on all those and share those videos, that video and press releases that we put out, that'd be really helpful. Uh, we did a, sorry, we also did a um, climate future town hall with youth uh, to keep them engaged and give them some hope because right now a lot of young people are really struggling. When I talk with teachers, I hear about that. So we really got to think about how we can help youth feel inspired for the future instead of not only the, the climate challenges, but now the pandemic, it's a really hard time mental health wise. So working to, to put out positive energy and get young people involved in what's possible for the future. And I'm gonna wrap up shortly and take a couple questions. Um, I was hoping to do it in 10 minutes. I think I'm gonna make it. Uh, along with the video, we are gonna start launching out the, the lawn signs in a couple of weeks. And so if you are able to help with um, getting some neighbors to take them, thinking about friends who live on good corners or bigger roads in your communities, who might want to take them and put them up. They're going to start going up in early June. We could use your help. You can email Dan at the campaign, Dan at Zuckerman, F-O-R-V-T.com. He's a volunteer coordinator. Uh, it'd be great if you can help on social media sharing. And we have a weekly volunteer check-in on Sundays at four. So you can also um, touch base with Dan to get onto that weekly Zoom call. And uh, we have some really exciting endorsements we're going to roll out in the next couple of days, some national endorsements. Uh, we just put out a series of state uh, elected leaders endorsements this week that uh, we're really proud of and um, would love to answer any questions that people have to uh, just check in. Ultimately, website, Zuckerman, F-O-R-B-T dot com. And um, yeah, questions for a few minutes because I think I've got four and a half more minutes, Anthony. I see Liz. I don't know if you want to call on him or me, but. Actually, there was a question, a chat question asking, it went down. It's not in front of me right now. I but see I one there. State about colleges. The state college, right. State college. Maybe you can talk a little bit about state Absolutely. colleges. Absolutely. I would say one thing, and I had it in my mind, and thank you for bringing that up, Marjorie. The state college bomb that fell from the chancellor. Uh, is probably the fastest grassroots reaction event I've ever seen in my 20 plus years in office. 
Within a week, there were 30,000 petition signatures. There were local groups and networks across the state with ideas, talking about solutions. You had the massive event in Johnson, as well as the car parade in uh, Montpelier. I was holding my press conference with 70 people on Zoom and over 700 people watching on Facebook when it was announced that they were gonna delay the vote. Uh, the governor on Friday, when the shoe dropped, said, well, this is the realities of the economy. I don't know what we're gonna do. And on Sunday said, well, maybe I don't like the proposal. I mean, his shift on, on, um, on that was pretty remarkable. And I think it's really important that anybody who supports the state colleges recognizes he has a seat on that board of trustees and has for the last four years. And so, you know, this is another instance where you know, maybe asked to add a million dollars here, a few million dollars there, but there really wasn't the urgent push out of the governor's office with the scale of the challenge coming forward. And so that's the kind of thing that I'll need everyone's help talking about. I think there's real opportunity to pick up votes throughout the whole Northeast part of the state. Uh, this whole election is upside down. Um, there's a lot of working people who might have traditionally voted Republican that I think with a populist progressive message are gonna be, um, really open to voting for us this time around. Uh, so wanted to throw that out there. I see Liz wrote in about austerity and local governments. Um, yes, uh, you know, I already pushed back on the schools issue and will continue to do so. I think we could use the CARES money really creatively. I'm thinking about ideas like, what if we used state money to rent the schools for childcare providers to have fewer people per room if we were to empty out the rooms and use them in, in a childcare situation where they have access to the bigger outdoor spaces of a school than a small um, space that a smaller center might have. And maybe have five kids in a classroom so that you don't have the density of, of kids in a room. This is off the top of my head, but the way that we're gonna get through this is creative ideas that you all reach out to me with, that we throw out there, including myself. And if people wanna shoot it to bits, they can, but good ideas is, a, is not something that all one person has. and so. Um, yes, Liz, I will be fighting back against austerity between CARES money and a municipal rebuild bill that has to come out of Congress. I mean, Mitch McConnell first said, let him go bankrupt. But when Republican governors and Democratic governors across the state go, are you kidding me? Uh, something's going to have to pass. And the question is, who's going to be in the governor's office to rebuild this state? Someone who looks in the rearview mirror or someone who's looking forward? And that's really going to be the choice people have this fall. I don't know if there's time for one more, Anthony, or not. Josh, his thing won't unmute. Y yes, we have time for one more. Maybe whoever's got it, unmute yourself and throw it at me. If not, I'll just assume it's all good. David, David it looks I got oh, one. Go ahead. David, what are your thoughts about the governor's response to the COVID-19 impact on people of color in Vermont? Well, as a whole, I haven't heard much of a response specifically. Uh, so uh, oh. that alone is disconcerting. Obviously, around the country, it has greatly disproportionately affected our communities of color. Uh, we have just historic entrenched inequity that's led to health <laughs> to get out. in terms of uh, higher rates of you know, diabetes and other uh, issues that then make people more vulnerable within our communities of color. I think it's from economic and wealth inequity over decades and centuries. Uh, and, you know, it really hasn't been addressed. And to me, that alone is an issue. Uh, we have issues with translation. I know Allison Cigar is putting out a lot of different uh, uh, <laughs> translations for a range of communities of color and immigrants. Uh, as well. And I've been reposting a number of those. Uh, so I think it's been uh, short as a whole. Kind of reasonably good job. And we have to be honest about that. And if we had just attack him on COVID 100%, that'll actually hurt us in our campaigns. But the unemployment issue is huge. Lack of attention to this issue, Mark, is big. And, okay, I not and I'm working on some statistics uh, around how the state has done a good job, but we were also positioned to do a good job because we are an incredibly rural state. And if you look at rural areas around the country, it's obviously affected us less. Can't so, change views or anything. I think I'll leave it at that. It looks like Anthony's got a 
figure something out here and, and probably go on to Doug anyway. But um, Mark, I'm always open to more information too. Feel free to reach out. I think Doug was next anyway. Go for it, Doug. Thank you, David. Doc, you ready for me? Here you go. Absent somebody telling me to stop, I'll just go ahead. Can you guys hear me? Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, let me echo something Anthony said earlier. Hats off to the new counselors in Burlington. And, and Jesse, uh, I love the t-shirt. I'll be getting one. And it reminded me of the, their predecessors from a long time ago. I've been here since the late 80s. And, you know, Gene Bergman and Terry and Earhart and Tom and, and all the crew, you guys are the next or maybe the next next generation. It's so important. Uh, I've never been on the ground door to door the way you guys have been and will going forward. So I have so much respect for that. There's a lot of good work to be done. So I'll try to make this quick as well. Uh, I made my living for 25 years as a policy guy. And my job now is a little different. Uh, I have to inform the work of managers and policymakers. And we do that with performance auditing, some of which is about the nuts and bolts of state government, which can be tedious, but is important because uh, it has to be run efficiently. There's only so much money. The rest is programmatic and that's of most interest to me. Uh, the former is about efficiency and the latter is about effectiveness. And for example, on the nuts and bolts side, you know, we've identified millions in potential savings and cost recovery, but uh, the administration doesn't always adopt our recommendations. So there are huge lost, lost opportunities, millions of dollars sitting on the table. Uh, the programmatic stuff uh, is more up my alley. And a good example is a report we did on economic development a couple of years ago, where we acknowledged, I acknowledge, as I've been saying for years, that most of the state's major economic development programs cannot uh, be evaluated objectively, period. We have no idea whether we're spending too much money, too little or not. And that's scary. They just keep doing what they've always done because they don't, for the most part, seem to have the backbone to call the question. And that doesn't mean they're not well-intentioned. They are, most of them. Uh, so that's a shame. Uh, as for what we're doing today, uh, this is a good one. We're, we have a report coming out soon on healthcare expenditures. And we hear a lot of talk from some quarters, the governor's office and so forth, about the supposing crushing burden of taxes, which certainly is an issue for some people, particularly property taxes. But we don't hear too much about healthcare anymore. Here's a crazy factoid. Healthcare has been growing a lot over the last 20 years, expenditures. If Vermont's rate of growth had been the same as the US average, then Vermonters would have saved a billion dollars in 2018. That's how bad things have gotten here. You may recall those of you who were around in the 90s, there was a lot of talk about how our cost per capita was one of the lowest in the country, completely flipped. We're in serious trouble on healthcare. Second, we are near to completing a major audit on the Green Mountain Care Board and One Care Vermont, which is our ACO. Uh, the first one is a descriptive audit because an awful lot of people, including me when we started, didn't really understand the complexity of this thing. So this is an effort to try to make it accessible to legislators and, and regular folks, lay people. And that will be followed by an audit of their performance, which is highly suspect. This is a problem. Uh, we don't have rigorous oversight of this entity. Uh, there are concerns about further consolidation in the healthcare industry and the added administrative cost of OCV. Uh, you may have noted that their recommendation or proposal for this year was that their administrative costs be $19 million. Now that doesn't sound like much in a $6 billion industry, but they don't provide healthcare services. They just shuffle paper. So it's really kind of scary. Furthermore, uh, and this is fun and something that's going on, I made a request of them under the terms of their contract with the state, that billion dollar Medicaid contract, clear as day. I want information about what they're paying people, which is not that big a deal, but it was a straightforward request. They told me they wouldn't give me the information. So I've uh, informed the attorney general that I need his help and we'll see how it goes. And you'll be hearing about this for sure. We're also working on an education job, which is about something that was brought to my attention regarding uh, the money spent supporting students who go to private schools in the state. And I think that's ramped up quite a bit over the last 10 years. And I'm not just interested in the money, uh, but I'm also particularly interested in the extent to which the state uh, oversees operations of the private schools. Not their finances necessarily, but 
all the things that public schools are required to do for and on behalf of students, is that oversight available in the private sector? Uh, also, um, you may recall from last fall, there was a very interesting announcement about VEPSI, the Economic Progress Council, which you've all probably tired of hearing me talk about, but the state's uh, flagship economic development program, VEGI, which is a business incentive program. Uh, this group gave this company, Marvel, which bought a spinoff from Global Founders, $4.5 million the day after they laid off 78 people. Uh, as it turns out, there's a lot wrong with this, and I'll be sharing that report when it makes more sense. There's no point in putting something out right now, given what's going on. So that's a fun one. Uh, we're looking at DMV, which handles $300 million a year. Uh, this is more of the nuts and bolts thing about internal controls. Uh, we're also devoting considerable resources in-house to tracking COVID uh, operations. You know, so much money coming into the state, serious questions about how the state's going to use it, which is uh, partly a joint effort with the legislature, but are they going to do it by the book? And it's better to catch it early on than, than pay the price down the road. Also, there will be some choices made by the administration, because some of the money uh, has some flexibility to it. I'm particularly interested in economic development. And it's not just this administration, it's successive administrations with the support of the legislature over the decades. They're inclined to reach for shiny objects rather than make strategic investments for the future. And that bothers me because this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for money of this uh, scale and magnitude. Second, with regard to COVID coming out of this, I don't hear anybody talking about what would now be considered the taboo approach of Dick Snelling back in the early 90s, when he, by today's standards, a moderate Republican, understood that yes, we might have to throttle back a little bit on spending, but it's not unreasonable at the same time to ask the well-to-do to kick in a little bit more. He actually got the legislature to raise taxes in a surcharge for three years. I'm sure a bunch of you on this uh, line remember that. And it, it was impressive that he got it done and that he was willing to support it. I hear no talk about that at all anymore which is really kind of disappointing. Uh, one other thing that's sort of rewarding for me, I'm not the guy that's out front for the most part, I'm, I'm just a numbers guy in the back room, but there is some talk today, understandably, about how the pandemic has exposed some of the weaknesses in supply chain, just the economics of how we get goods and services. And I wrote a report 20 years ago called The Leaky Bucket, which called into question uh, the wisdom of that and encouraged state policymakers to look for strategic opportunities to keep money at home. So I'm glad to hear that conversation. In any case, uh, the job can often be very frustrating, but I still enjoy it. Uh, there's lots to be done and I'd like to keep working. So I'd really be grateful for your support going forward. As for questions, Josh, I guess you or Anthony were in charge of that, but just to be clear, if you don't get to me now or today, I'm available. You can call me at work, which right now is my home number, 864-5711, anytime. Thank you. Hi, this is Anthony again. I just want to quickly apologize to both David and Doug. For some reason, my iPad got frozen near the end of David's presentation, so I wasn't able to move that along. And then Doug was trying to come on and asking if I was still there, and I was not there because my iPad was frozen. So I had to go out and come back in. Anyway, I'm back, but I just want to apologize for the glitch there. And I see Martha Abbott has a question. But Martha, you're muted. Doug. Can you talk a little bit about the committee the governor has appointed to spend some of the COVID money? Yeah, well, the, the governor appointed uh, three so-called action teams uh, several weeks ago, almost a month ago now. And once I saw that they had been developed and saw the list, mostly the usual suspects for two out of three of those groups, I contacted the secretary of the agency of commerce and said, I'd like to be added to the distribution list so I can know what's going on, tell me about meetings, materials being submitted and considered and so forth. She said, no, no. <laughs> you know, what do you do except laugh at stuff like that? And her excuse was, this is very informal. They might be talking to each other over the phone now and then. We don't expect any warned meetings uh, or formal presentations. Okay. now." I'll be the first to admit that any governor, when David becomes governor, he's entitled to seek advice from anybody he likes. That's appropriate. But if you set up a so-called action team to advise the governor on how to proceed and spend oodles of money, that should be transparent. They don't agree with me. 
Well, I don't know what the hell they're doing. Tell us who they are. Who are they? The usual suspects. It's people from the chamber. It's business people. Two of them are from utilities. It's kind of interesting. Uh, the economic development one is one from Velco and one from GMP. Uh, I think it's Frank Coffey from GDIC. As I say, it's the usual suspect. That doesn't make them bad people, but these are the folks who've been advising governors for 30 years. Let's have some new ideas. Um, Anthony, I see some, some um, chat questions. I don't know how much time we have left for this, but uh, I saw Kayla Rose had a question. Do you have the question? Yeah. Josh, we have about six, six minutes. Six minutes, okay. Um, and I'm assuming um, there might be motions for endorsement too. So let me let me maybe read Kate's and then reassess. So um, Kate, Kate LaRose asks, um, so these reports are incredibly important for transparency and it's incredibly difficult to get the average person to get excited about them. Doug, I'm wondering if you can share some examples and success stories of how people have dr drawn attention to these reports to good effects so that our neighbors care. Well, as I've said, and as I think you know, uh, I don't have the authority to compel state governments to adopt our recommendations or to take any particular actions. And I think people would say they don't want me or my successor to have that authority. Uh, we hope that the reports are both logical and well-supported and uh, lead thoughtful people to say, yeah, that makes sense, we should do that. Often they do, but not always. Uh, a good example for for uh, for this group is that the Department of Human Resources, on occasion, um, when there's an allegation of employee misconduct, has to put a person on uh, what's called relief from duty. Until the matter is investigated and it's determined what to do, if anything, that person goes home and they get paid. In the last four years, they've spent seven million dollars paying people not to work. We made some recommend. I mean, this is nuts and bolts and boring. I'm sorry, but uh, we made some recommendations that were intended to encourage them to clean up their act. And, you know, a few million here, a few million there, what the heck. And they have refused to adopt those recommendations and have told the government operations committees in both chambers that they simply won't do it. And the legislature has not called them out. They've asked a few questions, but they don't push the issue. It's bizarre. I don't understand it. <laughs> Furthermore, uh, as I mentioned, we have indicated uh, I've been saying for years that we spend millions of dollars on some economic development programs, and I can't answer the question, how well is that working? And they go, it doesn't matter. We're going to keep funding it, period. Mm -hmm. And they, they reach for shiny objects, like my good friend Michael Sorotkin, I, feel, I sound like a congressman, who created this crazy remote worker program to pay people to come here. Well, you know what? I came here 32 years ago because people like Gene and Terry and Tom and Earhart and those guys and Bernie and Peter were kicking ass and making Vermont the place to be. If we did that, we wouldn't have to pay people to come here. Anyway, sorry. Just get to um, do you have time for more questions? There, there are a few more in the chats. Let's do one more. Okay. Um, so Zach, Ralph just texted me as well. I guess I mixed, missed his chat question, he was asking just about, to talk about kind of your party affiliation, if you would consider running as a P slash D this time around, especially with Linda Sullivan in the race. Um, that was from Zach Ralph, I guess, in the in the chat. Question. I'm gonna stick with DP, it's worked for me so far. Um, I'd rather not give marginal or borderline Dems a reason not to support me. Uh, I don't believe that Linda Joy Sullivan has a great deal of support, but you just never know. Weird things happen in elections. Uh, I enjoy the work. I'd like to keep going, so I'm not going to mess with what has worked to date. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good to see you, Anthony. Can't believe I met you 30 years ago. It's ridiculous. I know. We were, we were reading the leaky bucket study at the time. <laughs> See ya. Thank you. Appreciate it. So the question, the next question would be whether or not there's any um, move, motions to endorse either of these folks. Martha has her hand up. Martha. 
There we go. So yes, um, following in the footsteps of Bernie Sanders and Anthony Polina, and then forging his own path for the last 24 years, David Zuckerman has been bringing our progressive values and vision into the political mainstream in Vermont very effectively, very articulately, while all the while while farming full time at the same time. Um, he's role model, being respectful to everybody, regardless of their opinion or party label. And for that, for all those reasons and a million others, I would like to move that the Vermont Progressive Party endorse the next governor of the state of Vermont, David Zuckerman. Second. It's been motioned and seconded. So the way we set this up, um, Josh, has been to send a ballot essentially to everyone. That's the right way of saying it. I guess, you know, I would move that. Is there is there support for casting one ballot on behalf of the on behalf of the group? What? Yes, sir. Yes, I move that we endorse both Dave Zuckerman and Doug Hoffer on one ballot. It's Adam Norton. So it's been second. So it's been moved and seconded that the committee endorse both Doug Hoffer and Dave Zuckerman for governor and auditor. Is and we'll do this by voice vote then. And what we'll do is ask everybody to unmute if they can. Unmute. Unmute. Unmute your button. Okay. This is the way we do it. I'm sorry, what? Just a quick question. Um, I want to know how, because I know we have voting mem members here and people who w shouldn't be voting. How are we going to know? I'm wondering if it makes more sense to use the raise the hand feature. That way we can check to see if that person actually is a voting member. Yeah. So, yeah. Anthony? I agree, Tanya. If I can, um, if I can jump in, so I have um, so there. There are a couple of things. One, I just want to make sure um, it is like a minor tweak, but if we want to do a nomination as well, there is a difference between the endorsement and the nomination. The nomination is what gives you the the P. So we might want to amend the motion to say just dot our I's and cross our T's, if that's what we want to do, to say endorsement and nomination. Um, and then if people choose, I do have, there is a feature through Zoom that allows us, I can send the poll directly to your screen and you can vote yeah. anonymously for both the endorsement and the fine. nomination. Um, yeah. And I have, I'm gonna, I just posted the link to the chat feature. Um, so, that link is to our state committee. Um, and oh, the cum trees are in bloom again. So th that, that link cum goes to our list of state committee and we'll tell you our state oh. committee members and alternates. Um, so if you're unsure if you're on the state yeah. committee or if you're an alternate, um, just go to that list and you'll be able to potentially go. All right. I'm. Uh, amend my motion to include nominations as well as endorsements of David Zuckerman and Doug Hoffman. I second that. Anthony, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Martha Abbott had her hand up. How can uh, not the nom we can only give the nomination through the primary. So, so I did, I got con con I confirmed this with the Secretary of State's office over the past week. We are allowed to nominate through this process right now, um, presuming that there's no, well, for, for, for David's race, for the LG race, because Chris Erickson is in, we couldn't technically nominate for him, but for Doug Hoffer, we can nominate right now, presuming no one files to run on the progressive primary ballot. Um, so we, we can do a nomination right now for that. And we can also, um, so, so yeah, I, you're, you're correct about David's race because there's somebody in the primary, but for, for Doug, we absolutely can do a nomination. 
So we're, we're talking about the possibility of nominating Doug Hopper for auditor and endorsing D Dave Zuckerman, or is it nominating just for the primary? Would we be nominating, would we, in terms of David Zuckerman, would we be dealing with just the primary or the primary in the general election? So for David, because there's somebody in the, in the primary ballot, um, we, we can do an endorsement for David to say that the party supports David Zuckerman. Um, and that's, you know, and our party's going to go to work. Um, legally, we can't give him the P that's, that is, Martha is correct that that's through the primary. Um, and because Chris Erickson is on the ballot, it's whoever gets the most votes in the primary. Um, right. So we're going to be encouraging people to take write in ballots, um, presuming that David wins the endorsement vote right now. We're going to be encouraging people to take primary ballots and write David Zuckerman in. Um, for Doug, because no one's filed to run in the primary, we're allowed to nominate a candidate to fill a vacancy on our general election ballot. So it's presuming that no one's going to win the primary for auditor and there's going to be a vacancy and we can nominate Doug right now to fill, fill that vacancy. So would someone, could someone state the motion then, just to be clear? So I move that we nominate Doug Hoffer for auditor. This is Tanya. Right. And point of information, Anthony, this is Emma. Yeah. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong though, um, we still have him until May 28th. Not that we expect anyone to file technically, but it's so easy to file right now because of COVID. Right. Technically, couldn't someone else still file and get on the Prague primary ballot for auditor and we would be in the same pickle? Yes, I believe so, yes. Mm -hmm. So we, you, that implies that we should just be dealing with up to the prime, just for the primary. Well, I think the same sort of qualifier that we are doing for Dave would apply for Doug because of right. this trickiness of filing. And also, again, I really want to emphasize anyone can really do this this time. Right. But it's only a dozen days away. So, you know, barring the fact that if something like that happens, we could do an emergency reconvene for Doug. But right now, I'm going to go ahead and nominate through the primary for David and Doug all the way through. Who was that? Frank. Oh, okay. I'm just trying to be efficient. <clears throat> Emma, does that make sense for you? Well, uh, you know, I love Doug Hoffer. I do. Um, but I just want to be clear that we're not violating and doing anything that's going to um, slap our hand as a party by following right. the rules of the Secretary of State, especially because there's unique rules this cycle. Josh here, I, 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 I went through this with the Secretary of State's office, um, you know, so we, we are absolutely allowed to do nominations now. Um, it's just, it, it becomes void if someone is running in the primary. So, um, that's, but, but we are allowed to nominate early before the filing deadline. Um, it's just- so we, so we can nominate both. And if somebody enters the primary or then we, we would have, we could reconvene, re, reconsider the question afterwards. Yeah. Can I amend my motion to say nominate instead of endorse or sure. endorse and nominate, endorse and nominate so that if the nomination doesn't work out, at least Josh has the, and the party has the understanding that we are endorsing and therefore we can start working for. I think Ellen Oxfeld has a question. Yeah, I have a couple of questions um, because there are a few technicalities involved and, you know, there might be even if a, a slight chance of having to redo one or the other of these. I think we should actually take them up separately. Not, you know, not for anything bad about either of the wonderful candidates, but um, let's say you had to redo one, you know, because somebody did suddenly enter and we couldn't do the nomination. So I'd like to see these as two separate motions. And I actually think, because again, it's somewhat technical and we wanna make sure we're doing this right, that instead of doing this, uh, you know, by acclamation or voice vote, we should use the um, vote feature in Zoom. Because you know, so where it's written, you know, because I just think we want to be clear on this. And so we have two things in place, nomination and endorsement. 
for both candidates. And so I think it would be better to take those votes separately. And then if one has to be undone, you don't have to undo everything, if that makes sense. Sure. I agree. And I, I, I apologize for talking about the voice vote. I thought, I thought it would save us time when I first said it, but clearly no, it has it not makes, saved us time. It makes it more complicated. And also I think in, in the case that something might have to be undone again for technical or legal reasons, it's better to do these. And you know the, vo um, the vote function in Zoom is very clear and it's written down. And I actually think that's clearer for people because you know exactly what you're voting on. Okay. So someone has to say the motion. Oh, so I move that we take each of these votes separately and use the um, vote function in Zoom. And we're gonna nominate versus endorsement? Uh, no, I believe that we would endorse first and then nominate, no? Does, you have a vote for endorsement and then a vote for nomination? I, I don't know. Josh, you would know better, but that, that's logical to me. Like you would endorse someone and then nominate them. And those should be two separate processes. I mean, it takes a microsecond to vote on Zoom, so we can do these as separate. Um. I have it set up so that we can, yeah, whatever whatever people make sense, I can create the poll question quickly and send it sure. out to folks. I just think it's a lot better. So we're talking about endorsing both in the primary, both in the primary, is that the way we're looking at it? I think um, my understanding is what we're gonna vote on now has to do with the August primary. Right. And then we can do a separate vote for the general election. I don't know if that would be now or in a different meeting. But again, I think those need to be separated because you don't want to get yourself into um, a technical mess. Right. Marge has her hand up. Oh, Marge. Uh, I think we do need two motions. But one motion can only be to endorse because there is a primary already, right? The motion for um, Dave can only be a motion of endorsement because right. you know who is running in her uh, in on our ballot at the moment, and so we can endorse him and request our, our members to vote for him in the progressive primary. Uh, in the case of Doug, at the moment, there is no um, other candidate um, in the primary on our ballot. So we could both endorse and nominate. And if somebody ran on our ballot who was not Doug, then the nomination would just fall by the wayside, but the endorsement would still be there. Which is why they have to be separate votes. A separate vote for endorsement, a separate vote for nomination. And right. each candidate must be separated because that's the only way to do this. The two candidates should be separated. Definitely, definitely right. yes. And endorsement and nomination should be separated. So you're talking three votes. Ellen. Yeah, but it takes like a second once Josh right. sent it out. Okay. <laughs> All right. So somebody needs to offer a motion. I don't, I don't necessarily, as a chair, I don't want to be offering the motion particularly. All right. Move to endorse David Zuckerman. Move to nominate and endorse Doug Hoffer. And let's just fucking get this over with. Okay. <laughs> Can we do that? For the Josh? Second all of that. And there's, it's been seconded by Robert Millar and others. And this is for the primary, correct? So, so yeah, so the endorsement should be for the primary um, and then the nomination is through the general presuming no one else files to run 
for the auditor race. So I can move I can move through those questions pretty quickly. They're they're all okay. all ready to go if people um, want. The one the one caveat is um, I just re, you know it's it's important that only state committee members and alternates vote. So I just want to reiterate that you can go to the list that I sent on the link um, if you're unsure. Um, if you're on that list, only only state committee members and alternates got the email for this code to log in. Um, so only those people should be authorized to vote in this meeting um, or should be on this meeting anyway, other than our few panelists. But just if you have any question, double check. So we Josh, can you explain again how we're going to vote? So I, I have the question, I have the poll ready to go. So the, the question, the first question I'm, I, I believe is, shall the Vermont Progressive Party endorse David Zuckerman for Lieutenant Governor? Um, when I hit launch poll, you should get a pop-up yeah. um, pop up on your screen that allows you to answer that question. And we'll give it like, you know, a minute or two for people to answer and then we'll get immediate results back. Um, and it's anonymous, so, um, you know, we, we, we won't know how you vote. It's a secret ballot. Josh, you mean for governor, not lieutenant governor, right? Oh, sorry. Oh, my God. Yeah. I'm, I'm so used to. Um, I'll, I'll edit that. But yes, it is for governor. So, can that happen? Um, yeah. Should, should, I off, should I launch the poll? Yes. Okay. Do it. Oh. I guess I'll vote yes on it. <laughs> Anthony, it's Tim here. I just want to tell you that it popped up on my screen, so I hit abstain. And so okay. there was no other way to make it go away, but <laughs> explain one of the abstentions at least. Okay, actually, and it popped up on mine, but I'm a co-host, and it says hosts and panelists cannot vote, so I don't, I don't get to vote at all on this one. Oh, um, I did that too. I also hit abstain. Oh, I just hit the X in the top right corner, and it went away. Uh -oh. I hope yeah, somebody if, voted for me. If you're um, not authorized to vote, please, um, you don't need to hit abstain. Just don't don't vote, and that's that's fine. And I'll I'll end the poll in like sixty or thirty seconds. It wouldn't um, go away without me hitting something. Hey, Josh, are you, um, even though this is anonymous, are you still able to see who's actually voting on your end? You know, um, yeah, I, I believe I can see who voted or I'll be so. able to see who voted, not how they voted. How about you? So we have 48 of 60 people on have voted so far. Cool. Really? Josh, can you Josh, meet Josh, how does it work Who's if there's it? two people at a site? Um, Did you hear me, you like, Josh? If you like, maybe email like if me. it was me and my husband. Okay, I was yeah, just maybe, wondering. Maybe email me husband. the result of, if you're having an issue like that. Sweet, sweet. <clears throat> hey, give me a call back. Um, or... Can we do the can we do the next one now? Let's do, do uh, it. Okay, so I'm gonna end the poll right now. Um I'll give it five, four, three, two, one. Okay, we're we're gonna close the poll. And I think you should see. Do you see a pop-up with the results? Not yet. Okay. Well, if you, you might not get a pop-up with the results, but mm. the results were um, 47 yes votes, three abstains. I'm guessing some of those abstains were the people who had discussed that they had abstained. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a 94% um, of, of all the people voted. And David Zuckerman is endorsed. Good. Uh, now, now you should see the pop up. 
There, there it yes, is. We see it. Cool. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm going to get out of that. So there was also a motion to nominate and endorse Doug Hopper. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So do we need to, can we do that as one question or do we need to do that as two separate? What's? I think one. Okay. Yeah, just do it as one, that's fine. Okay, so the question is going to read, shall the Vermont Progressive Party endorse and nominate Doug Hoffer for Vermont State Auditor of Accounts? Correct. Okay, we'll launch that right now. So you should all see that. What if you're unsure of whether you have the right to vote or not? Um, so I, I had said I posted that link. I'll repost it right now. Um, that's the link to the state committee and alternate list. Um, and you can you can go right there and tell you if you're a member or alternate right on that list. So So we have 47 of 60 people have voted so far. Just give it another like 30 seconds. Okay just ended and there are your results. Woohoo, congratulations, Doug Hawk, people's <laughs> Well <up>. deserved. <laughs> congratulations, David. Doug. David and Doug, congratulations and thanks for all your hard work. So can we move on? That took a little longer than we had hoped. Yes. Yes, please. Okay, we're going to hear from the lieutenant governor candidates next. We're not planning on doing an endorsement, as we mentioned earlier in the meeting, because we didn't, did not warn it as an endorsement meeting. So um, what we're going to do is hear from three candidates for lieutenant governor, who I believe are here, both all here, Tim Ash, Brenda Siegel, and, and uh, Debbie Ingram. And no particular, I, I'm going to just call on them in the, in the order in which the list was made. So no particular reason for this. It's not alphabetical or otherwise. Uh, we're going to hear from Brenda Siegel first, and then Debbie Ingram, and then Tim Ash, if that's okay. And we have we, we set aside a total of about a half hour for this discussion, which I think should still work. If, if people just could talk for about, figure you're going to have about eight minutes to, to explain your positions and why you would seek the endorsement or support of the party. If you want to leave time for questions or two, you, you'd have to be less than that. So it's not a lot of time. And that's really the reason why, one of the reasons why we decided not to make this an endorsement meeting for Lieutenant Governor, because it's going to be basically a limited exposure to a couple of candidates. And we thought rather than rush into an endorsement process that we would make this an introductory session. And then over time, people have the opportunity to talk with these candidates more and the party could make an endorsement later on during the during the campaign season. So if that's okay, I would ask Brenda Siegel to address us if that's, Brenda, are you there? I am here. So uh, I have terrible internet, like very bad and it's been worse the last two days. So if you stop hearing me, give me a thumbs down and I will mute myself and let someone else go and come back. Uh, so, uh, I think most, a lot of you know that uh, when I first announced my run for governor in 2018, the first article that came out about me said something like, from the Bennington battlefield to the Derby line, you can hear a resounding who? Because we couldn't really conceive of someone like me, a low-income single mom, running for an office like that, or having a place in our government at all. 
But what Vermonters really showed us during that election was not only do we want uh, our elected officials to reflect our own experiences, but also that we understand that when people who have faced the problems are at the decision making table, then real solutions emerge. And we're seeing examples of that right now uh, with mutual aid networks popping up all over the state uh, and people volunteering in their organizations uh, and or doing what they can do, which might be just staying home with their kids and homeschooling and uh, working from home. We've also seen examples of this with our kids and young adults walking, rallying, marching and interrupting our very own legislature on issues of climate change. And out of that is coming the Global Warming Solutions Act. And we that same kind of work can create uh, the a Green Mountain New Deal or a Green New England New Deal or both. And I think that we're seeing right now that our climate that that when we that when science dictates we must make change, we must change our behavior, we are able to do that. And we have to do that for climate change too. We can't just do it now and then forget that that matters. And we owe that to our children, to ourselves, and to the earth. We also really need our leaders to be people who can react in a crisis, uh, which I think that, that, that there is no argument that all of us have our skills there. Uh, but, but I was also one of the first, I came right after David, to stop doing in-person events. Uh, and then within 24 hours, our, we put up a statewide mutual aid effort. Uh, and we spent the next month connecting people in need with volunteers. And then as, as individual mutual aid networks showed up, we uh, were connecting people to those individual mutual aid networks or organizations and sh shifting our volunteers over to those communities. That is not my first experience with crisis, as most of you know. In 2011, uh, my son and I lost all of our belongings in Tropical Storm Irene. Uh, and in that same crisis, it was community members who came in and they helped me throw away 28 cubic yards of our belongings. And uh, I was very fortunate to have family that I could live with for the next two years. Out of that, I developed the Southern Vermont Dance Festival, which uh, is a long-term economic driver for our community in Brattleboro. Uh, we connected resources that exist in our state, in our area, it's arts, recreation, and agriculture to uh, our town government and our businesses to create a, an economy that will drive, not just during the event of the festival, but throughout the year. Throughout the year. Uh, we're gonna need that same kind of creative economic thinking coming out of this crisis. And we also really need people who understand how to be on the ground working in our communities and we can get on ground level with people and, and when they say, I am suffering, they know that you understand, that you have been there. We need to, right now we're in the shell of an economy. Right now we are, um, we need to build our economy from the bottom up because wealth is not trickling down and poverty is trickling up. And we have an opportunity right now to grab on to paid family medical leave and livable wage and uh, Medicare for all. But those are just tools. We need to actually, create um, our goal and then grab the tools along the way to get there. And it's essential that we're building our economy with people and the planet first. A green economy is the way out of this crisis. It's not, we can't do it now because we don't have the resources. We have to make that investment. Most of you know also that on March 7th of 2018 was when I decided I would run for governor. And on March 8th of 2018, my nephew died of a heroin overdose. He was the son of my brother who died just over 20 years ago, also while using heroin. The system failed me and us as it has so many others. And we have to focus on harm reduction first, treatment and recovery on demand, including medically assisted treatment on demand, dual diagnosis support and criminal justice reform. That's why during my campaign for governor, I released a four part plan to heal the opioid epidemic, the overdose crisis and uh, since then, I have gone around the state and country meeting with state's attorneys, police chiefs, people in recovery, people in active use, and family members of those who have lost to make sure we're moving forward progressive drug policy. Right before this pandemic, we had a win uh, with decriminalizing buprenorphine. It came out of human services. Thank you, Sandy, who was huge, hugely moved that forward. Um, and it came out unanimously. 
uh, that was in partnership with people like Sandy and advocates who worked very hard also communicating with the Republicans to make sure that that got out in a comfortable way. Uh, we can't just stop there though we have to be working on education and that means that we have to have broadband in every corner. I mean, we have if, if you ever, if there ever was not an example of us needing broadband in, across the state, then this is it. Uh, and we also need to have universal meals uh, in schools that would have made this moment much easier. And we need to implement that ethnic studies standard that was passed that is so important to our schools and equitable education. And we need to change our funding structure to a progressive income tax. It's extremely important uh, that we also talk about racial justice at every turn. Um, I, many of you may know that our candidate forum was Zoom bombed. Uh, they stole the screen and drew swastikas. I've never experienced anything quite like that, but I have since found out that um, I'm likely a target. And, uh, and what that says to me though, is I'm not wearing that on my skin and we need have never done enough for black and brown people and immigrants and new Americans and migrant workers. And we have to do more and we need to center our policies in, on, in, in equity and justice. As a teacher, a movement builder, and a business owner. I know that what we have to do is we have to bring the people to the people's house. We need people on the ground who understand how to work on the ground. And as Lieutenant Governor, we need to work in partnership together. We need an inside outside approach so that we can ensure that the policies that pass are puts people and the planet first um, and they center our most marginalized communities so that we can have the best, most powerful, strong uh, policies across the state. And I just want to end by- Yeah. Brenda, are you finishing? You have one minute. Yes. I just want to end by saying thank you all so much uh, for all, all, many of you I've worked with over the last few years, um, some of you before that. Uh, and it really is, uh, I do uh, sort of come home to you uh, working through policy and talking about progressive issues because uh, it, it is, I can come to you at, at many times and have uh, and reach out and we all have worked together. And I, th I think it's just incredible the work that you're doing. And I'm really inspired by this meeting. Um, and uh, we've been doing issue-based events and I hope that you guys will join us um, for some of those. Also, I think that I will get in trouble if I don't also say, <laughs> I hope that you all join me to volunteer and donate. Um, and uh, you can reach out to Jacob at brendaforvermont.com uh, to have those opportunities. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you, Brenda. Appreciate it. Is Senator Debbie Ingram with us? I am. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks a lot, Anthony. And thanks to all of you. It's very nice to be with you today. Um, my name is Debbie Ingram. I use she, her pronouns. I am a state senator representing Chittenden County. And I want to talk to you about my record in the legislature. But first I'd like to focus on my record as an advocate and an organizer. Uh, because for the last 13 years, I've been the executive director and lead organizer for Vermont Interfaith Action which I know many of you are familiar with because I see lots of faces that, I, that we've partnered with in the past on many different issues. Uh, just to highlight some of them, we've had a campaign for several years now that we call um, Building a Movement Toward a Moral Economy. And we've supported raising the minimum wage and initiating a paid family and medical leave program. Um, we have worked very closely with Rights and Democracy uh, on that. BIA was the um, or partner uh, for the whole co the Raise the Wage Coalition with RAD. Uh, we've also partnered with um, Migrant Justice on their Milk with Dignity campaign. Um, we um, have partnered in the past with uh, Justice for All and the ACLU and um, through um, our membership, VIA's membership in a national network, we have used community organizing uh, methodologies that have been successful for 45 years that harken back to the civil rights movement and to Saul Alinsky. So I'm, I'm very well versed. I've had lots of training in, um, in that and um, working to um, make the fruits of a grassroots movement uh, come, to, come to pass. 
And I've also had um, a great deal of training in my own implicit bias and um, making me aware of my white privilege, my white fragility, um, the things that, um, that I need to be aware of to be um, truly um, a good organizer and a good human being and to really advance the causes of racial justice. Um, now, uh, in my Senate career, I have also um, taken all of those issues and uh, I had a chance to peruse the Progressive Party's platform and um, it looks like um, economic, social, environmental justice are the, the three pillars and I would hold my record in all three of those against um, any legislator. Um, I serve on the Health and Welfare Committee, where I have been a champion for universal health care, um, both through my work at Vermont Interfaith Action, but um, also since I've gotten to the Senate, I was one of the sponsors of a universal primary care bill, and I have worked in many different ways to um, try to uh, make sure that we have um, greater access and lower cost um, for our health care system. Um, I also serve on the Education Committee, and um, through that um, have also been trying to advance um, uh, progressive forward-thinking ideas there. Um, Anthony has uh, introduced um, legislation um, during the years that I've been there that I've supported for uh, trying to come up with a tuition-free program, and right before the COVID um, crisis it, we were as a committee trying to um, develop a bill that would pay for two years of uh, tuition at all of our communities. Um, I, uh, the first bills that I uh, helped to um, sponsor were the raising the minimum wage and uh, the, the family program. And then also um, I was the um, introducer of the bill to change Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day uh, permanently, and um, I, um, I, I got scoffed at, to be honest with you, uh, by some uh, veteran lawmakers uh, repeatedly, but I introduced that every year, and uh, it, it finally came to pass um, uh, this past year. Um, with regard to race, I have uh, sponsored six different bills uh, to um, set up a racial justice oversight board that led to the racial equity panel that, that now exists and with the um, executive director of racial equity. Um, I uh, helped to co-sponsor the ethnic studies bill um, and I've concentrated on several bills to promote race data collection, especially with our law enforcement and to change the training practices for law enforcement. And I um, was the primary sponsor of the uh, proposal two, Prop two, which uh, would change the state constitution to um, clarify the prohibition um, against slavery. And that has, has moved um, from the Senate and is in the House. Um, climate change, I've um, one of the co-sponsors of the Green New Deal with Ant another bill that Anthony uh, introduced. And um, with regard to women's issues, I've sponsored uh, equal pay bill and um, the child, big child care bill that, um, that passed um, uh, last year. So um, that's kind of a laundry list of all the different things that I've been working on. But I think uh, the reason I've come um, to you folks and that I asked for your endorsement um, is because I, I feel that uh, in many ways you, you, are my, um, you are my home, my policy home. Um, we do need to be more progressive. I love that, that, uh, in, that graphic image of a, a movement that, that I know that, that Bernie has perpetuated, that, uh, that David has taken up, that Anthony has taken up, and I would be proud to, to be a part of, of that. Uh, that is where, truly where my heart is. And then the last thing I would say is um, another one of your statement of principles is our country, state, and localities can reach their highest social and economic aspirations through truly representative democracy. And I am proud uh, to identify as a lesbian, and I would be the first openly lesbian statewide office holder in Vermont, and one of only, there are only six others in the country. So, um, I will stop there. If I have a little bit more time, I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any. Any questions? 
If not, thank you for coming. Thank you for being with us. Appreciate it. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I may have to jump off. I have a work commitment with Vermont and Faith Action, but oh, that's okay. Everybody's been very patient. You folks have waited to near the end of the agenda. Appreciate your patience. Thanks for being with us. Anthony, just a quick point of information. There is a question in the chat, I think that applies to all three candidates. So if Debbie does have to leave, perhaps all three can, could, it's uh, Chris Brimmer, Mr. Secretary had uh, posted yeah. that. <laughs> yes. What was is it okay if I answer that? Sure. It, it's a. Well, how would you run as a D, DP, or a PD? Yes, I've already signed an agreement that I would have the D first, so I would run as a DP. Thank you. Thank you. Wait, there's another question. We just still have another minute or so, and there's another question just came in. Um, let me go find it. What about your what is your position on taking corporate contributions? Um, I well, in all my fundraising, I have found that I, I, I if I knew more rich people, I would probably do better at fundraising. I don't know that many people who own corporations or or who are very wealthy. I must say, uh, uh, but um, uh, no, I not to make a joke of that. It's a very serious question. Um, I I am against corporate uh, contributions and. Um, um, and not foresee taking any. You still there? Your voice? Debbie, can you still hear me? Yes, I can. There is another question, which is uh, why haven't you sought progressive support in past elections for all what have you done to support our party and our candidates in the past? endorsements, uh, financial support, et cetera. Right, yes. Well, you know, having lived in other states, I grew up in the state of Georgia and I lived in California for a long time. Um, it, it took me a little while to get acclimated here and um, uh, and really understand the Progressive Party and, and what it was doing. I was raised by FDR Democrats and uh, my dad was um, mayor of our little town. And so I had you know, some loyalties to Democrats. And it was really through my work at Vermont Interfaith Action that I began to understand um, how terrific the Progressive Party is and, and that it is a strong presence here in Vermont. And, um, and it's, it's, it's evolved over time that I've understood how important uh, your contributions are and how much my views align. Um, and so really, especially to being in the Senate uh, and serving with, with, um, with Anthony and um, Chris Pearson and, and Tim and, and David and understanding more about uh, you know, what, what the Progressive Party has done, um, that I've really realized that I, I, I fit in well here and I would be honored um, if you would acknowledge that and, and endorse me. Thanks, Debbie. Appreciate it. I want to. Um, people asked about asking um, those same questions about the money in the party to Brenda Siegel as, and to Tim um, when he comes on. If it only takes a moment, I would ask if. Um, is Brenda, are you still with us? I am. Yes. So there were those questions that were brought up at the end of Debbie's Debbie's time with us about corporate contributions was one of them and then um, the other was your support for progressive party in the past and moving forward yeah so i uh, we did sign a contract saying that we in order to have the voter file it's saying that we would run dp um and we would have to pay quite a fine if we were to switch it and frankly as a marginalized economically marginalized candidate that's just not something that's going to be possible for me um and uh, but I, but I do want to say that I do show up at state committee meetings, and I do show up at local progressive committee meetings, and I have been doing this work with you all. Um, and then, in terms of corporate contributions, I'm absolutely against them. Uh, I, it, in fact, we need to move to public financing that is required for everybody. Candidates like myself are deeply marginalized going into races, and we absolutely are going to have to change the structure if we want in the way we fund elections if we want ever to have equal representation um, across our state. 
there something has to shift because also candidates like myself can't serve in other offices. Sure. Thank you, Brenda. Appreciate it. So waiting, talking about waiting patiently. I assume Tim Ash is still with us. I am. There you go. You're welcome. Thank you. And Anthony, you know how patient I often have to be working in the legislature. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Tim Ash. Um, I'm currently the president of the state Senate, obviously a candidate for lieutenant governor and actively seeking progressive support. Uh, I'm going to say a quick bit of background, uh, then talk about what I've been accomplishing uh, in the state Senate in recent years, and then talk a little bit about my vision for the lieutenant governor's role and what I expect to bring to it. Um, I came to Vermont to attend the University of Vermont. I'm kind of a classic middle class kid. My mother is a career public educator. My dad spent 43 years as a probation officer, uh, both of uh, which influenced me pretty strongly in terms of my support for public education and also uh, in reforming our crim criminal justice system. When I left UVM, well, when I graduated from UVM, I should say, I went to work for Bernie for about three years. It was when he was still a congressman. And one of the advantages of having, at the time, a very small uh, staff in his office was I got to travel the state with him uh, corner to corner time and time again and really got to learn side by side from him. Uh, and while I'll never uh, claim to want to be uh, the next Bernie and some people feel they have to model after people, I've totally been inspired by him and still remember the day I told him that I was leaving his office. I said, you know, you've really, I've learned so much from you. You've inspired me. It's time to, for me to go off and do my own thing with my own particular uh, approach to serving uh, people. After I worked for Bernie, I uh, worked at CVOEO, which is the community action in Chittenden County uh, as the director of the mobile home project, which works with mobile home communities throughout the state who are facing habitability or other problems with the landowners to try to resolve them. So I worked alongside many people and um, was proud to consider many of them friends, some of them who I still stay in touch with. The bulk of my professional experience has been at Cathedral Square. I was there for about eight years, uh, developing affordable senior housing all throughout Northwestern Vermont with my professional mentor, Amy Wright. And we uh, developed about 400 apartments in that time, did the largest weatherization project, I think, in Vermont history, uh, and also developed a few solar projects. So it was a, while it was housing, it also brought up all these other climate change actions, which was really great. Uh, I served as a progressive Burlington City Councilor for four years. I served alongside Phil Fermanti and then Clarence Davis, for those of you who remember Clarence, who has moved on to other great things. Uh, and then I served uh, as the first Senator uh, with the progressive nomination, I think in Vermont's history. And so I've served uh, as a DP since 2009, the last four years of which I've been the Senate President. I think despite getting uh, becoming Senate president, at perhaps at the worst timing in modern American history, because Donald Trump became president at exactly the same time, we've been able to pass some of the most progressive legislation in America. And sometimes it's worth uh, repeating what those things are. All of these things have been done under my leadership, though I will never claim that any piece of legislation passes because of one person. So as I knock off this list, I wanna be clear that it's been working with people like Anthony and Debbie, and frankly, the vast majority of members of the Senate who have made it possible. After many years, we finally passed the most significant increase in minimum wage in probably 20 years. In the Senate, we had developed a veto-proof majority on paid leave. As you know, the House fell just one vote short, so that's, uh, that time will come. We passed long-term water quality funding, which had eluded the legislature and governors for many, many years, passed the first meaningful gun safety legislation in Vermont's history, put the, a woman's right to choose in statute and set in motion a constitutional protection, making us the most protective uh, state in America at this time, passed first in the nation legislation to reimport prescription drugs from Canada, which has now been modeled uh, after by about four other states, it might be the only area where the Trump administration seems to be working with Vermont and not against us. I also set in motion uh, what's called the ASH challenge to reduce our 
number of inmates in Vermont uh, correctional facilities uh, leading to legislation this year, which will pass, uh, which we are calling justice reinvestment, uh, which stands to make real inroads, reducing the number of inmates and also moving towards uh, better services for people. And then last, and this is something that has often gets forgotten, two years in a row, 2017 and 2018, I led the effort to block Governor Scott's very, very draconian proposed cuts to our public K through 12 system. Uh, if those had gone through and there was a lot of pressure to let them go through, uh, we would be looking at a very different K through 12 system right now. And I was proud to stand alongside all the people in the legislature who joined me in opposing that. Running for Lieutenant Governor, things have taken a little bit of a twist with COVID-19. There's no getting around that. My theme for years of service has been closing the gap between the two Vermonts, both struggling rural communities, letting, getting them up to the level that some of our more successful economic communities are at, but also tackling uh, poverty head on. Those have been the two themes that have animated everything I've done uh, in public service. And in some ways, this COVID-19 crisis and running for Lieutenant Governor uh, brings an even greater opportunity to accentuate those two themes, whether it's investing in uh, food production, rural agriculture, uh, youth employment programs, expansive broadband. Um, th this is actually the moment to be uh, doing some things which maybe we struggle to do on an annual basis because the, uh, the, the crisis imperative isn't there. And so I believe that right now, as we face what is a very, very serious financial uh, and public health crisis, uh, we need someone in the Lieutenant Governor's office who not only has a clarity of vision, but has successfully uh, made things happen and can navigate what is going to be a very, very serious financial storm with revenue reductions that massively exceed what we saw during the Great Recession. I'll stop there and answer a couple of the questions that were raised before in terms of my uh, involvement with the Progressive Party. As I said, I was a city councilor, progressive city councilor for four years. I was a monthly donor sometime in the past. I have recruited candidates uh, for state rep and city council and worked on their campaigns and helped run some of them uh, and have worked alongside progressive senators and house members uh, the entire time I've been in the legislature. I do not take corporate campaign contributions, which is just one of the reasons that uh, working with Anthony, we passed a corporate campaign finance ban, which has been languishing in the house, uh, but we hope that we'll, uh, we'll see action there. And I can't remember if there was another question that I've missed, but I'll leave it there. The one, there was one question about whether you would run as a oh. DP or a PD. Yeah, I, I'll run as a DP as I have since 2008. There was another question basically asking about your feelings about moving towards Act 48, which is the universal health care bill, whether you've been supportive of that effort. Um, well, of course, I supported Act 48 and helped write it. Um, and. I, I believe that we have to continue moving to realize the goals of it. We have near universal coverage right now, but not near universal affordability. And frankly, with what's going on right now in our healthcare system, uh, it's not gonna make things uh, better in the short term. Um, I, have, I have had the challenge, of course, of being in a leadership position where I have to balance the interests of 29 other senators. Uh, one of my goals has been to increase uh, the amount of money that our insurers are paying for primary care. Uh, we've made some progress in the last couple of years. Also uh, helped lead the effort to have the largest expansion of Medicaid dental for adults uh, in 25 years. So there was a question which was, wouldn't we be better off if you stayed as pro tem of the Senate? Why do you want to be Lieutenant Governor? Well, I'll tell you, the, uh, I don't know. Who, it's it, a question, it, I'm just repeating the question. It might be subjective, uh, the question and the answer, but for me, uh, I've been really blessed to be in the Senate for 12 years and to be the leader for the last four. And I would not have traded that experience for anything. In the last couple of years, the thing that I have enjoyed most is getting out of the State House, 
going out to the community, working with people in the field, getting their ideas about how to more fundamentally transform things, come back to the legislature with solutions. Medicaid Dental arose from just those kinds of meetings. Three years of significant boosts in mental health spending arose from those kinds of conversations. The legislation which uh, increased the amount of medication assisted treatment in our jails arose from conversations. I was the lead sponsor of that bill in the Senate. And so for me, uh, now is an opportunity for me to take my skill set and knowledge of how government operates uh, to be able to do that with a greater platform and play a bridge role between the governor and the legislature um, to help solve the particularly difficult challenges that we're going to have in the next 18 months. Well, we're, we're basically out of time, but I, I guess I don't want to leave it hanging. Somebody also asked about your efforts, what you see as the primary efforts to attack climate change and get away from fossil fuels in terms of making progress there? Well, we've doubled the amount of money spent on weatherization, but uh, I have been raising the possibility of a weatherization bond. Uh, the treasurer has been a bit of an obstacle uh, to such a proposal in the past, uh, but we've begun conversations about that, which could significantly boost the amount of uh, residential and commercial uh, building efficiency throughout the state. I'm also one of the lead sponsors of S267, which would not only accelerate our 100% renewable goals, but increase the amount of that renewable power that has to be generated here in state. Uh, and then lastly, uh, I've been the most outspoken proponent of joining the Transportation Climate Initiative, which would guarantee reductions in the transportation sector, which I believe is one of the most promising environmental um, strategies because it has us joining force with about 12 other states uh, to make real, real improvements on our uh, emissions from the transportation sector. Well, there were, there were more questions, but we really are out of time. So I appreciate you spending time with us, Tim. And we'll no, thank you. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So folks, in terms of the agenda, we had talked about taking about 15 minutes to break down into regional groups, to talk a little bit about how you see the elections going on in your regions and whether there are candidates you want to support. That kind of, now, I won't mention though that we're basically at the time when we thought we would be adjourning pretty much. So the question is whether or not we want to extend the meeting by about 15 or 20 minutes to allow for the regional groups to meet briefly. And I, I mean, I would say we will, unless, but I don't want to do it if people object and feel like we really want to call it a day. So there have been people saying that um, they would rather adjourn and put off the regional meetings to another day. So if that's if that seems to be the direction people want to go in, which is fine, I would agree with that. So I would just um, say that we we may want to revisit the question of the lieutenant governor's race somewhere down. We have another state committee meeting coming up in early August. I don't know if that would be um, too late to take action towards supporting a candidate in the lieutenant governor's race, but that's something that Coco and the others can think about. Um, I just want to thank everybody for being with us today. This worked out surprisingly well, I think, from my point of view. I want to give Josh and Mary all some credit for that, obviously, um, because I think to be able to handle this many people in this kind of format, I thought was really a challenge. And I'm pretty sure that we did better than other parties have been able to do in the last couple of months. Um, I want to go back again and just thank the folks from Burlington, where we started this conversation about the achievements of the young people and the people bringing new energy into the elections in Burlington and cementing leadership on the city council in Burlington. I think that's really great. And I think that's an energy that we'll carry forward with as we go around the state in this particular coming election. I think the fact that candidates across the state are asking for our endorsement and nomination support is also a really important signal to the importance of the Progressive Party and uh, all the work that we do, not just during the good times, but the bad times, it's actually really shown through as well. So I just wanna thank everybody for being here today. And if there's not any other comments or questions. Hey, Anthony. <coughs> yes. Anthony, this is Jane. Um, I was just wondering since we have two minutes and maybe we could go over like a minute or so, um, could we let Brenda answer some of the questions as per Jack's comment? 
Some of the questions that were asked of the other lieutenant governor candidates? Correct. Sure, I'm not sure I'm gonna remember exactly which ones they were, but we had healthcare, climate change. Um, or maybe any that she feels comfortable speaking to at this. Okay, that's, that's, that's good. Brenda, are you still there? Yes, I'm not sure I'll remember all of them either, but I will answer anything I remember. And if you, someone wants to remind me if I forget something, that's- I know one of, one of them was about universal healthcare. Okay. And there was climate change and fossil fuels. Those are the two that I think okay. are lingering. Um, so um, first, I think there was also a question about have I supported progressive candidates in the past? And I have. In fact, Tanya Viahovsky and I work pretty closely together. We are do issue-based forums together and we're doing fundraising, um, joint fundraising with the Green New Deal and Medicare for All um, and uh, have done, she's been on like four or five of our issue-based forums. So that we've been actually working together this race, um, but also in the general election last year after my, uh, last time after my race, I was supporting um, lots of progressive candidates as well. Um, so that will continue. And also I, I continue to show up whenever I can. You're awfully far away from me in the state committee meetings, but whenever I can, I continue to show up um, and I will continue to work with everybody on that. On Medicare for All, I'm a huge supporter of Medicare for All. I've spoken at rallies and testified and uh, done press conferences. We also did a Medicare for All event and I'm speaking with Betsy Sweet um, with Progressive Democrats of America has invited me to speak with Betsy Sweet at a, at a Medicare for All rally. Um, I mean, town hall next week. I think we're meeting next week. Um, and then uh, on climate, on fossil fuels, we need to move away from fossil fuels. And I think we actually need um, to the bill that just sits on the wall needs to be moving. Um, and um, and I think we're, it, it is absolutely essential. We don't have any choice. And we and I'm 100% in support of that. In fact, I just uh, filled out Sunrise paperwork for Middlebury and was talking in depth about that issue as well. And it feels like it deserves a really in-depth answer. So I'm happy to send anyone um, in-depth information on, on what I think about climate change, but I have been working on the issue. And Tanya and I, hopefully by the end of this week, should have a Green New Deal fundraising, joint fundraising with uh, progressive candidates from all the way, from all across the country going out. So I just want to put in a plug, please donate to that. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Brenda, appreciate it. Um, appreciate you sticking around as well. Thank you. So I think a couple, two things I would mention given the comments that are coming in now in the chat. One is that people wanna hear more from these candidates. They're interested in hearing more from them. And um, it's not unfortunate, but as you remember, um, Debbie Ingram had to leave to go to another event. So she was not able to answer all those questions near the end. But the other thing that people are chatting about is saying how they like the format of this particular meeting and they would prefer, some people would prefer to have remote meetings. So um, it's something we could consider. I think if you wanna send comments to Josh or any of us about the benefits or the pros and cons of meeting this way, feel free to do so. I mean, I think it, it, we were able to cover a fair amount of ground and we did it in a fairly organized way. In other words, and also people didn't have to travel, you know, the snowstorms we drive through to get there in the winter and the, uh, beautiful sunny days that we take an extra two hours out of our time to move to commute to a meeting and then commute back home. So we're reducing our fossil fuel footprint as well by having remote meetings. So maybe there's something we'll consider for the for the future. All right, I'm going to, I'm sorry, Josh, were you going to say something? Oh yeah, I, I was just going to say, um, I saw a lot of comments about people wanting to have more time for like the LG race and like one thing I've been thinking about and um, you know, I, I've been talking to folks about as a possibility of doing like a specific candidate forum just for the LG. We could set aside like an hour and really get deep more deeply into some of these questions. Um, and that was kind of one of the thoughts around not doing an endorsement at, endorsement at this meeting, but giving people a longer chance to kind of engage those candidates. And I'm really interested in if the membership has different ideas for like how we can have a process around this over the next couple of months. Any comments or thoughts? The idea of maybe holding a, a not a, not a state committee meeting, but a separate meeting, which is more that like a, uh, a mm -hmm. candidates forum for lieutenant governor, maybe make a decision after that. Because if we to, next state committee meeting is going to be pretty close to the primary, just a week or so before the primary. So if people have comments, speak now or send us an email. Send Josh an email or send one to me or one of the others on the Coco. 
and we'll consider doing some kind of an event where we get to hear more from the candidates for lieutenant governor. I think that would be good. Okay. Cool. Okay, meeting adjourned. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Oh, bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, I don't know what that was about. That's never happened before. Josh, we're still live on YouTube, just so you know. Um, but uh, I'll take us off live right now.